Hello, my name is Josef Macej. I am a doctoral student at the Technical University in Košice, Faculty of Manufacturing Technologies with seat in Prešov. I would like to tell you something about design and evaluation of robotic angle arm production for a collaborative robot. Our goal was to produce a robotic arm for a collaborative robot which is composed of external angular planar and cylindrical surfaces. It was necessary to achieve high dimensional accuracy, especially the accuracy of holes for gearboxes. Work NC software was used to create the 3D model, generate the production drawing and the NC program. We decided to build a collaborative robot because collaborative robots play an important role in increasing flexibility, especially in production processes that produce a number of small products in short cycles. Collaborative robots can quickly adapt to changes and the robot has great endurance to perform the same task with high precision around it. This combination makes it possible to automate the production of many types of products on the same production line. The picture shows the Yumi robot, the world's first truly collaborative robot which was introduced in 2015 by ABB. The innovative double arm robot, which can cooperate with humans without barriers, brings new functionalities to automation. Yumi was designed to start a new era in the industry, for example in the assembly of small parts where humans and robots work together on the same task. The entire range of Yumi robots is designed to be as easy to set up as possible and as intuitive to program as possible. This means that even workers without special training or previous experience can use robots successfully and efficiently. Collaborative robots can operate various uh, CNC machine tools. They can be used anywhere where it is uh, possible to produce multiple parts with the same technology. Robotic angle arm for all collaborative robot is composed of outer angular planar and cylindrical surfaces as you can see in the picture. Robotic angle arm provides a rotational movement from the gearbox which is located in a fixed base to the other arms of the collaborative robot. It also serves as a supporting element for other robotic nodes. We decided for duralumin as the material of the angular robotic arm. When manufacturing a diameter of 47 mm, the deviation of the roundness shape of 50 micrometers must be observed. When manufacturing an outer cylindrical surface with a diameter of 50 mm, the tolerance of plus minus 40 micrometers must be observed. This surface is not visible in the picture because it is located from the bottom. The required arithmetical mean roughness for an outer cylindrical surface with a diameter 50 mm is 1.6 micrometers and maximum height of roughness is 11.2 micrometers. We used work and see software to create a 3D model of the robotic angle arm and subsequently generate a production drawing. The 3D model was also used to simulate and generate an NC program for the FANUC control system. Work and see CAM software is state of the art automatic CNC software for surface or solid models in mold and tooling companies for 2 to 5 axis CNC programming. Work and see is used by all Western, Japanese and Korean automakers and well-known OEMs from a variety of their industries. Work and see is one of the best complementary CAM software that enhance all design and manufacturing systems by providing reliable, efficient and programmable cutter 
paths leading to unmatched productivity and safety. In the first step, the coordinate system in the middle of the path was selected as you can see in the picture. As you can see in the picture, next step is choice of tool, which is face milling cutter. We adjust its feed rate and speed volume. We create for machining external planner and cylindrical surfaces. In the next step was performed a simulation which shows potential collisions between moving elements. Picture shows simulation of the machining of the face relief. Next picture shows a simulation of machining of the inner cylindrical surface to a diameter of 28 mm. Another operation is the production of a diameter of 100 mm to a depth of 46 mm, which will be produced after turning the semi-finished product. This is followed by drilling 14 holes with a diameter of 4.3 mm and 4 holes with a diameter of 5.5 mm. As in the previous operation, it is necessary to select a tool Define a feed and drill speed. For machining the angle arm, we used CNC Machining Center Pinnacle VMC 650S. Picture shows the production of cylindrical surface with the diameter 50 mm. Before machining at the CNC machining center, the operator makes sure that the workpiece and tools are clamped correctly. The size of the cutting conditions will be adapted to the size of the clamping surfaces of the semi-finished product and also to the, its rigidity. Measurement of surface roughness of produced diameter of uh, 50 mm with tolerance of plus or minus 40 micrometers was performed on a uh, Mitutoyo SJ400 device. The finished robotic flange was fixed in a manual vise with uh, flat jaws with uh, marked measurement points for arithmetical mean roughness and maximum height roughness as you can see in the picture. A Tom 3D measuring instrument was used to evaluate the roundness of a cylindrical surface with a diameter of 47 mm. The robotic angle arm was fixed using a vise with jaw surface. This picture shows measured roughness values, arithmetical mean roughness and maximum height on cylindrical surface with diameter 50 mm. The mean arithmetic volume of roughness for the diameter 50 mm was RA 0.95 micrometers and RZ 4.91 micrometers. The roundness deviation for the 47 mm diameter was measured to be 31.3 micrometer. By comparing the required and achieved de deviations, it is possible to state that the manufactured component is suitable for assembly and the prescribed function. After the machining and surface treatment by anodizing, the assembly with the base and the assembly of another actuator 
followed as you can see in the picture. The safety of the collaborative robot is built directly into itself. So fencing becomes a thing of the past. ABB's growing Yumi family of robots is part of a new and exciting collaborative automation solutions that help humans and robots work together safely. At present, such robot constructions are used on power lines with lower component weights up to 10 kg. The work NC application was selected to generate the NC program. Its inner core of the processor, Parasolid, is designed for machining shaped surfaces for molds and complex rounded surfaces which cannot be programmed using manual or workshop programming. Like several CAM applications, work and see allows machining simulation, collision indication, etc. The production of a robotic angle arm for a collaborative robot was carried out in the Faculty of Manufacturing Technology School workshop at the Pinnacle VMC 650S Miling Machining Center. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, contact please Associate Professor Peter Michalik. This work is a part of research project Vega. Goodbye. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome everybody who is attending this online session and this virtual conference. My name is Jerzy Brosh and I'm a researcher at the Czech Technical University in Prague. And 
I would like to tell you something about the autonomous vehicles and also about the cooperative systems and its testing. First of all, I would like to make a small introduction or overview into the field of ITS. And I would like to express uh, the meaning of several uh, abbreviations that will be used during the presentation. So the first one is ITS itself, that means Intelligent Transport Systems, that covers all of the smart solutions uh, used in a transportation, such as uh, detectors, sensors, vehicle and roadside equipment, as well as uh, back offices. And the second abbreviation, uh, the CITS, is dedicated to the cooperative intelligent transport systems. That is the subset of, of the ITS focused uh, on the communication uh, among the cars, roadside infrastructure, traffic management centers, etc. It is also known as uh, V2X uh, that, represent, uh, that represents a vehicle to anything communication and that could be also divided on the uh, vehicle to vehicle communication, vehicle to infrastructure, vehicle to the network, and vehicle to pedestrian communication. The last and also Im and also important point uh, is related to the automated cars or autonomous vehicles. Uh, that is the main topic. Uh, of this presentation. So, uh, the autonomous vehicles and its using as a challenge that we are facing. That's the vision of the future. Uh, the cars will be going on the road automatically. These vehicles uh, will be able to recognize in which lane they are they will allow the platooning, they will be able to calculate optimal speed based on the current situation and make their own decision how to react and how to drive. These vehicles are equipped by several sensors, detectors, radars and lidars. They are able to monitor uh, their surroundings and detect, it, uh, and detect the other vehicles and their position. They are able to estimate how uh, big is the gap between the vehicle uh, ahead and react. They are also able to determine whether it's something on the right side or on the left side and they might have also several other functionalities. Autonomous driving is the new approach of the transportation, but as I said, they are able to react on the current situation and monitor uh, their surroundings. That's the benefit, but also uh, that's the limitation, because they are able to react on the things that are somehow visible. But what about the things um, or the obstacles or the situations that are unpredictable, unexpected, and that are not detectable? Uh, and uh, this situation could be also dangerous. There is a solution that is named as a connected vehicles or CITS as well as V2X communication. These systems and units that are implemented in the cars provides a communication among them but also with the uh, roadside units placed along the roads with the pedestrian that are on the pavement and close to the road etc. 
This is the solution that helps to avoid an obstacle that is around the corner, that is invisible, that is unpredictable and unexpected. The, equi uh, the, equ uh, the equipped vehicles get uh, the information in advance and it ensures safety because of the knowledge that is shared from the other we uh, devices. So that's the impact that would be used in the transportation to increase safety as well as traffic efficiency and especially it's helpful to avoid accidents no matter what the situation is. The CITS is already deployed across the Europe, especially due to the Project C-Roads that is co-financed by European Union. The Project C-Roads is focused on the implementation of cooperative systems in several countries. The similar way is observable in the US as well as in Asia. On the previous slide has been mentioned that the CITS is implemented in several countries, but we are still in the beginning of the implementation phase. The roadside infrastructure is ready, but the implementation in the vehicles is not so fast. We are still somewhere in the first phase and the penetration of the unit is uh, not so high. Uh, that's the evolution process that will be probably faster than the usage of autonomous cars and it seems uh, to be the opportunity. The combination of both is the future. The CITS provides additional functionalities to the autonomous cars and I would like to show you in the last part of the presentation the cases that are already implemented and that will be useful for the autonomous cars. No matter if the communication will be among the cars with the infrastructure and traffic management centers or with uh, other users of the, on the road, especially vulnerable road users such, uh, such as pedestrians, cyclists, etc. The cases that are related with the communication among the cars could be, for example, when the road works are ahead uh, and the lane can be closed. For example, when you are going to the place where weather conditions are not suitable, where uh, you are not able to see over the hill, where the vehicle breakdown is ahead. But also important scenario could be the situation when the risky vehicle needs to go fast and you should go away to clear the road out for the smooth transit of the emergency vehicle. The communication with the infrastructure is also needed. It ensures the connection with the traffic management centers and it provides the extended information. The information about the state on the traffic light will be provided as well as uh, the information about the railway crossing. Data could be aggregated within the time period and shared to the vehicles. The communication with vulnerable road users ensures the safety not only of the cars and drivers, but mainly of the other users, such as pedestrians that are going on the pavement or that are walking exactly on the edge of the road, or uh, when the user crossing the road, etc. The communication with vulnerable road users can be also used as a prevention of the workers on the road they can be equipped with the unit and share the information that they, they are going in the road work zone 
The vulnerable road users such as motorcyclists can share the fast information about the falling on the road and ensure the safety. All these mentioned cases are useful not only for the drivers but also for the autonomous driving. The CIT is, is ready, the infrastructure is built, but the interaction with the driver is required. And that's the goal for the future, to find a solution that will be useful not only for the drivers, but also for autonomous cars. Solution that connects the CITS ecosystems uh, together with the autonomous cars. Then the autonomous cars become to be smarter and smarter and the combination with CITS might be the approach that will ensure safety of the passengers as well as other users on the road. But first the CITS should be reliable and the shared information should be relevant. This is the reason why the testing of CITS has to be performed with the best effort. I hope that the cases I presented are relevant and could be useful in the future of autonomous vehicles. Thank you for your attention. Dear conference participants, uh, at the beginning, let me introduce the paper and the authors of the paper. 
I'm Suzana Miladić Tešić, coming from University of East Sarajevo, Faculty of Transport and Traffic Engineering. The second author is Goran Marković, professor from University of Belgrade, Faculty of Transport and Traffic Engineering. In the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about uh, our paper entitled Development of Optical Networking for 5G Smart Infrastructures. The paper is consisted of uh, several sections. We started with some uh, basis and general information about the role of the optical technologies in the supporting smart city concept. We gave smart city layered architecture, defined several research questions and uh, gave answers to the questions and made some concluding remarks at the end. As I said, uh, I'm going to say a few general and global uh, informations about optical fiber communications. It is well known that today's uh, real-time applications and uh, diverse and different communication services uh, require huge bandwidth, uh, low latency, and the technologies that uh, could provide such requirements are optical fiber technologies. The functioning of the smart city concept is based on optical communications. So, in order to uh, be uh, well organized and to function, uh, uh, one smart city concept has uh, and must uh, have reliable and strong uh, communication infrastructure. Uh, smart city concept is also triggered by the growth of urbanization, and the problem in the standardization is. Uh, different definition of the smart city concept. Every city has its own definition of the smart, of the term smart, but uh, what is uh, common for each of them are the uh, requirements. Requirements are mostly related to latency and the bandwidth because in all of the smart city applications uh, we need uh, real-time responses, we need uh, real-time traffic management, and in order to achieve such uh, applications, we need uh, uh, technologies that will provide low latency and technologies that will provide huge bandwidth. So, 5G uh, wireless networks that are the basis of uh, smart city functioning are uh, provided and will be provided by optical fiber technologies as a communication infrastructure that is necessary for the smart city concept. Uh, through the paper, we defined four research questions. Research question one, what are the 5G requirements on optical networking? So what is the difference in the migration to 5G? The second question, what are the available and emerging optical technologies that will support such concept? Research question three, what is the role of flexibility in 5G transport? The flexibility is one of the main changes that characterizes the 5G networks. And the research question four, what are the research challenges on deployment of elastic optical networks in 5G transport? Here we present a smart city layered architecture and uh, we try to find place of optical technologies in uh, such architecture. Uh, you can see that uh, optical technologies are mostly at the device and sensing layer where the data are gathered in the form of optical sensors and actuators. And if we talk about uh, data transporting, optical technologies found place at the network layer in form of optical access technologies and optical transport networks. Further our uh, service and application support layer. Data synthesis uh, start with the research question one. Research question one are 5G requirements on optical networking. We highlighted the uh, significant ones starting from the growth of traffic volume, which is 100 times higher in five 
uh, G networks compared to 4G networks. Then we have high user data rates. Uh, uh, 5G networks are expected to support end user data rates up to 10 gigabits per second, uh, what is, uh, for example, 10 to 100 times higher than in 4G networks. Then we have low energy consumption, uh, low latency, which is in some time critical, critical applications less than one millisecond, high spectral efficiency, uh, which must be at least three times higher than in 4G networks, and low cost and minimization of the equipment. Those are some uh, most important requirements that uh, should be defined at the beginning of the implementation of such concept and that must be provided if we want to have a smart city concept and a communication infrastructure that will provide real-time applications. The second research question uh, is related to the emerging optical technologies that will support 5G transport. Uh, the difference in uh, uh, 4G uh, transport radio access network compared to 5G is the cloud-based uh, radio access network. So in order to support front hole and back hole and the radio access network of the 5G networks, we need reliable optical technologies. Uh, reliable optical technologies are passive optical networks and peer-to-peer -peer optical networks, but uh, passive optical networks uh, are a better solution because fiber is infrastructure is uh, better used. So three passive optical access networks are potential candidates for supporting uh, 5G wireless networks such as high speed, low latency and uh, low latency, uh, time division and wavelength division passive optical network. So depending on the available technologies, passive optical networks are divided on time division or wavelength division, division networks. Uh, wavelength division networks are mostly based uh, uh, and uh, are possible with joining the wavelengths or increasing the data rate per wavelength, while time division multiplexing passive optical networks are based on uh, reducing the time latency. Uh, in this figure, you can see the development of uh, passive optical networks in the last uh, two decades. Uh, so standards uh, such as high-speed PON uh, networks or next-generation uh, Ethernet passive optical networks are uh, uh, developed for the smart city concept and are mostly used uh, by telecom operators. The third research question is focused on flexibility and the role of flexibility in 5G transport. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, in traditional optical networks, uh, we had the term fixed grid. Uh, what does it mean? It means that spectrum has been allocated to a, dem to a demand no matter of its size. So we had one channel and uh, the capacity of a channel is allocated to a demand and no matter of its size and we had the uh, spectrum wastage. Uh, the term flexibility means uh, network adapting to some traffic or network conditions and that some parameters such as channel spacing or modulation formats uh, may be uh, adaptable uh, using uh, required equipment. And in such case, the whole optical spectrum, as it has been demonstrated on this uh, figure, is discretized in units. So, we have constant bandwidth on demand. We have one demand, and instead of the whole channel, we allocate only the necessary number of these units that are called uh, frequency slots. So, the space between channels in traditional fixed concept was... Uh, uh, 
100 or 50 gigahertz, it was of fixed character, while in the concept of flexibility, it has been reduced to uh, reduced to 25, 12.5, or even 6.25 spectrum width. So we have no spectrum wastage because the imperative of uh, telecom operators would be uh, a rational usage of the spectrum and all resources in the network. Of course, uh, in order to implement uh, such elastic concept and uh, the migration from one to uh, a new technology always has some research challenges. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, since we talk about a smart city concept where we have real time applications and where you need real-time responses. Uh, one of the research challenges is uh, dynamic light path establishing to predict traffic dynamicity, uh, to solve the problem of spectrum fragmentation in the uh, routing of uh, traffic, and uh, what to do if we have uh, some failure on some uh, network links or elements, uh, how to solve energy issue, and at the end, how to manage the network uh, and what is related to the control plane design. All of these issues are some open research challenges. So, in this paper, we gave an overview of uh, optical technologies that are capable and uh, suitable for supporting 5G wireless networks that are the basis for the smart city functioning. Uh, optical access networks in form of passive optical networks need to be improved and enhanced in terms of bandwidth and latency because uh, these are the two main requirements uh, that are uh, the prediction for efficient smart city functioning. And uh, in uh, order uh, of uh, improvement and enhancement, the bandwidth and latency, uh, we will uh, achieve real time, uh, we will be able to achieve real time traffic management and real time responses in the applications of a smart city. Thank you for your attention, and if you have uh, any questions, please do not hesitate to contact us on these uh, given mails.
Hello, my name is Samir Abdo from Technical University of Kushitsa, Faculty of Aeronautics, Department of Aviation Engineering. I am going to talk about enhancing the aircraft maintenance management process for increasing safety. The most effective way for performing inspection and discovering the de defects non-destructive testing. In the aircraft maintenance program, especially in the case of aircraft wheel overhaul, it is important to examine the mechanical damage such as cracks, corrosion, and some other surface irregularities and evaluate the extent of repair work. Aircraft maintenance. What is about? Purpose of aircraft maintenance national regulation. Non-destructive testing explanation types of destructive testing wheel testing the purpose of aircraft maintenance is the overhaul repair inspection or modification of an aircraft or aircraft component the maintenance of aircraft registered in the slovak republic register must be performed in accordance with the approved and updated maintenance program International Civil Aviation Organization develops policies and standards, undertakes compliance audits, performs studies and analyzes, provides assistance and builds aviation capacity through many other activities and the cooperation of its member state and stakeholders. We can say the non-destructive testing is a wide gathering of investigative procedures utilized in the science and innovation industry to access the properties of our materials. Part of framework without causing harm. Dye penetrant testing is used to detect casting, forging, and welding surface defects such as hairline cracks, surface porosity, legs in new products, and fatigue cracks on in service components. The most important is to choose the right liquid and remover. Prior, of, prior to the test, the area to be inspected and at least one inch either side shall be free from any features that many inhabit the test or mask unacceptable discontinuities. These include but are not limited to slag, spatter, oil, scale, rough surface, and protective coatings. To identify a leg, ferrous particles, either dry or in a wet suspicion, are applied to a part. These are attracted to an area of flux leakage and form what is known as an indication which is evaluated to determine its nature, cause and course of action if any. Posted AD current testing is a, is a static technique able to measure spot percentage variations in steel uh, thickness through 
any non-conductive and non-magnetic materials between the sensor and steel surface such as air, insulation, material, concrete, plastics, coatings, paint, seawater, marine growth, deposits, oil, and so on. The primary advantage of forced eddy current technique over customary swirl current st strategy is that it holds a continuum of frequencies. Because of this, it is conceivable to evaluate the electromagnetic reaction to a few unique frequencies can with only a solitary advance. Data from a scope of profound deities can be procured at the same time. Superconducting quantum interface device is the touches attractive field sensor not able these days. Squid frameworks give high effectability at low ex excitation frequencies, permitting quantitative evaluation of attractive field maps from the researched structure, permitting the location of more profound Im imperfections and high linearity. Today, the aircraft wheel are inspected from the outside with a circumferential scan measurement after taking off the tires. In order to safety, safely detect small hidden defects, the aircraft wheels has to be disassembled and be inspected from the inside. The prototype of squid system for aircraft wheel testing consists of an automated test stand with the wheel slowly rotating and a robot with the squid equipment scanning stepwise along the wheel axis. While the aircraft wheel is turning, the robot moves the cryostat along its rotor contour. Thus, a two-dimensional eddy current mapping of the outer surface of the wheel is performed. Pulsed eddy current has a pro broadband of frequencies, which is advantage for any eddy current passed in the T. Techniques due to the frequencies dependent skin effects, the post AD current methods can be done without the requirement of contact with the uh, surface of the material. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Dalibor Dobilovic and I will represent the paper with the title Architecture of IoT System for Smart Monitoring and Management of Traffic Noise. The names of other co-authors of the paper, their affiliation and email contents, uh, contacts you have on this slide. Uh, for the introduction, Europe, uh, Europe-wide activities to reduce environmental noise have a different priority over environmental issues such as air and water pollution. Often because such issues are considered to be better addressed at the national or local level. The Republic of Serbia has regulated noise protection measures called Law on Environmental Noise Protection. As the information on the impact of noise on human health has become more accessible, there is a need for a higher level of protection for EU citizens. The problem is produced by traffic noise on city roads because such roads pass through urban settlements near hospitals, schools and cultural monuments. The European Union has defined the term environmental noise and refers to uh, unwanted and harmful external influences caused by human activity, including noise generated by transport, road, rail and air, and exposure of the population to noise in the cities. A model of IoT system designed for monitoring the noise in the cities caused by the traffic is presented in this paper. The name of the system is Urban Noise MS and it is developed with the idea to be used with a number of sensor stations deployed along the roads in the most sensitive part of urban areas. The sensor collected data are sent to the middle well layer of the system for analytics and routing of uh, the traffic to reduce noise in targeted areas. The system uses LoRaWAN, one of the most applied LP1 technologies. For high scalability, easy maintenance and expansion, the system architecture is based on microservices and MQTT protocol is used for inter-system data transfer. Modified extra shortest path algorithm is used to calculate alternative routes for vehicles. Uh, just brief to explain low power wide area networks or LP1s, uh, these technologies are a group of technologies designed for usage in wireless wide area networks in order to provide long range communication for IoT systems with low bit rate and low power consumption. Uh, LP1s can be divided in two groups. One are the cellular technologies such as NB IoT and LTM, and the second group is uh, non cellular technologies such as LoRa, LoRa 1, Sixfox, Ingenu, Waitlist, and several more. LoRa is proprietary wireless te RF technology designed by Semtech Company, which is one of the driving forces behind the LoRa Alliance. LoRa Alliance has hundreds of members and uh, it, uh, it was founded in 2015. This organization is responsible for development of LoRa 1 protocol and related ecosystem. Here on the picture you can see uh, the LoRa 1 protocol stack, where on the bottom layer, on the physical layer, is a LoRa modulation with, uh, which uses different bands in different countries. For example, in Europe, uh, it uses um, 868 and uh, 433 MHz band. In US it uses 915 MHz band and in Asia is 430 MHz band. On the medium access layer there is a, a LoRa Mac, uh, LoRa uh, uh, part of the stack and uh, on the upper side of that architecture is application layer. The architecture of Urban Noise MS system is designed in accordance with the five-layer IoT system architecture. You have uh, five layers here. On the bottom you have perception layer where the microcontrollers, uh, sensor nodes, uh, sound, air pollution, proximity and other sensors can be placed. On the transport layer there are the technologies uh, which uh, role is to transfer collect data to the center of the system. Those technologies can be uh, at Ethernet, can be fiber, can be Wi-Fi, Zigbee, Bluetooth, low energy, LoRa, LoRa 1, etc. In the middleware layer are the majority of the servers of the system. There are uh, several applications, database, web servers, uh, uh, analytics and reports is done here in this layer. Uh, in this layer are situated uh, messaging protocols such as MQTT, MQP, etc. Application layer has a client applications mainly based on HTTP and HTTPS, XML and JSON and similar technologies and on the business layer are utilization, management and security issues. 
the prototype presented is this paper uh, don't cover uh, application and business layer here on this picture is uh, description of perception and transport layer where you can see on the picture on the right the road with the vehicles and uh, uh, data nodes and devices uh, deployed on the side of the roads uh, on the picture is a data collector marked with one and his role is to collect data from nearby and known stations with via Wi-Fi, ZigBee or similar short-range technologies. The second role of data collector is to send collected and accumulated data to the central node that is a LoRaWAN gateway. Uh, the data collector configuration used in this prototype is based on Arduino Uno R3 microcontroller uh, board, Libelio multi-protocol shield, LoRaWAN, uh, RN2483A model, LoRa module and uh, Wi-Fi ESP8266 module and analog sensor for sensing the noise. Also, uh, speaking about the end nodes, we can say that there are two types of end devices, basic function end device and extended function end device. The difference between the basic function end device and extended function end device is in sensors, because the basic function end device contains only sound sensor for monitoring traffic noise, and extended function end device has additional sensors, e.g. Uh, for example, for air pollution, for traffic frequency, such as smart cam cameras, proximity sensors, etc. Uh, here on the picture on the right is presented uh, 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 system deployment, mainly in the uh, perception, transport and uh, middleware la layer. In the perception and transport layer, you can see uh, the sensor nodes uh, deployed on the side of the traffic routes. Uh, which, uh, and they can monitor the traffic noise. Uh, they send that data to LoRaWAN gateway, which is marked in the picture as with number 2, and it is placed in the middleware layer. The rest of the middleware layer is uh, database, system, the server applications, web application server, etc. Uh, the in application layer, layer are applications that uh, allow users to have a, uh, access to, to data of the system and on the uh, marked as uh, number five there is a business layer. Uh, LoRaWAN gateway presented here uh, with number two is device uh, uh, RAK wireless model, RAK7243. It is composed of the following components. It is based on Raspberry Pi single board computer. Uh, it has RAK2245 P hat. It uses SX1301 uh, communication model and it uses uh, UBlocks Mark 7 q GPS model for geolocation. The code of the system is presented here. The complex structure of the software architecture has the following components. This is a, uh, here is a packet forwarder and a chip stack suit. This is an open source LoRaWAN server uh, containing uh, gateway bridge, network application and geolocation ser server. Uh, number three component is a Mosquito MQTT broker, open source software. Uh, number four is Urbanoise MS Core with microservices for processing and data analysis for NoSQL database, uh, reading and writing data and for monitoring. And uh, uh, finally, number five is a client applications for data access and visualization. Uh, so, uh, on the picture on the left, you have a LoRa packet forwarder marked with one that forwards RF packets received by the LoRa gateway to Chipstack gateway bridge with UDP protocol. Chipstack gateway bridge forwards packets to MQTT broker. Chipstack network server component removes duplicated LoRaWAN frames and deals with authentication, make layer commands, communication with application server and scheduling of revised downlink frames. Network server communicates with application server and geolocation server with the gRPC protocol. Uh, geolocation server is used for positioning LoRa gateway devices with an integrated GPS model and the application server is responsible for the inventory of all received data and handling of joint requests and encryption of packet payloads. It offers also integration with MQTT and Mosquito Broker in the system. Microservices use MQTT protocol as event bus and for internal communication and there is a microservice for packet data processing marked with 7. 
uh, there is a service for uh, microservice for the database writing marked with 8 uh, also microservice for database reading marked with 9 uh, the database is NoSQL MongoDB system. The system provides data visualization also for the clean application. This is uh, marked uh, as uh, uh, number tr 13. Uh, data requests are directed to Web API and Web API component further contacts microservice marked with 10 for data monitoring analytics. One of the main functionalities of this system manage is the management of traffic noise and is, uh, this uh, functionality is performed in microservice marked with number 10 and this microservice is uh, service for uh, data monitoring analytics. Here is the example of usage of Dijkstra algorithm for routing a traffic. Uh, the data collected with Urban Noise MS are used for the routing of traffic or at least as a recommendation for the routing. The basis for the traffic routing is the Dijkstra sort sortist path algorithm. The city of Zren is mapped here as a simplified graph with 37 nodes and 60 links between the nodes. Each link represents one uh, of the main roads uh, in Zrenin. Nine streets are chosen for monitoring. Those streets are enlisted here in the slide. And uh, those uh, streets are streets in the certain uh, sensitive part of the city, uh, the part of the city with, with hospitals, uh, schools, kindergartens and other sensitive uh, institutions. Uh, on the picture on the left you have a simplified uh, image of uh, graph of holes running and on the picture on the right you have a magnified uh, portion of the picture from the left. As you can see there is a route between nodes uh, T22 to T, uh, T18. This route, uh, route is sensitive route and it is marked with a uh, thick uh, blue line. Also the other routes, uh, sensitive routes are marked with different colored thick lines. Uh, so, uh, we have here a uh, compa co comparison of results with using the standard uh, dice algorithms such as shortest path and quickest path and uh, to our uh, proposed modifications of algorithm. Standard uh, dice algorithm uh, have a, a, a two different approaches for determining the path cost between the nodes. In shortest path variant, path cost uh, is actually distance in meters between two nodes. For quickest path variant, uh, the path cost is uh, uh, time in second needed uh, to reach uh, one node from another node. And uh, in our two proposed variations of algorithm, there are two approaches. Uh, the fixed path cost modifications increases all destination path cost on sensitive roads by 20% and the variable path cost modification takes into account three levels of noise on sensitive roads. The, those three levels are low, medium and high. Where the noise level is low, the path cost of sensitive roads uh, is not modified. When the level is medium, path cost is increased 10% and uh, when the uh, level of noise high, path cost is decreased with 20%. For this simulation we assumed that each level of noise is represented equally, so it has uh, one third of a time. So each level of noise is uh, 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 present in the simulation 33% uh, of time. So in table 1 you have comparison uh, of uh, increase of traffic depending on the algorithm. Uh, the least uh, amount of traffic is with shortest path algorithm and you have about uh, 2,800 um, 2, meters uh, passed by the vehicles. Uh, with the quickest path algorithm uh, you have increase of 8.81 percent with fixed modification algorithm you have increase of traffic with 12.88% uh, and variable mod modification algorithm gives about 9.86% uh, which is not uh, too high compared to the fixed uh, modification algorithm. In table 2 we can see root segment load uh, 
So with the shortest path algorithm we have something that can be called the normal load of traffic routes. With quick, uh, quickest path al algorithm we have slightly modified number of passes through certain routes. routes. And with fixed modification algorithm uh, we have a completely other picture because some routes such as route between node 13 and 14, route between nodes 22 and uh, 36 and routes between nodes 18 to 22 are comp uh, as you can see they are completely cut out from the traffic. It is not good because uh, with this approach uh, we will overload some other routes without uh, necessity. So um, in variable modification algorithm uh, you see that uh, uh, we have balanced uh, traffic, we have a, a lower uh, number of passes on certain sensitive routes and only one route is cut out from the uh, from the routing uh, uh, directions uh, this is a route between nodes 22 and uh, 36 so uh, this uh, variable modification uh, dice algorithm shows itself to be more efficient uh, compared to fixed modification and on the other hand it gives uh, uh, good uh, uh, balancing of the traffic in the city. Uh, also we propose an, the, another solution uh, for using of dice algorithm based on the collected data. In this approach, uh, depending on the time of the day, it is necessary to reroute traffic to avoid an extensive level of traffic noise. The routing process is dynamic and it is done by changing the cost of certain sections of the route, bearing in mind that several criteria that affect the costs are used. Uh, such as distance, time, time of day and noise, the method of vector technique normalization was applied. Three main transit routes through Zrenia were considered, which connects three other cities, Novi Sad, Belgrade and Versace. For each hour during the day, transit routes and their cha change were monitored. Table 3 presents rerouting the Novi Sad, Belgrade route vi via the Zrenian route. Uh, it is from node number 1 to node number 27 during the day. As you can see in the table 3, uh, there are four periods of day. Uh, for example, the one period is from uh, 22 hours in the night uh, to 8 hours in the morning. The second one is from 8 hours to 9 hours in the morning and so on. You can see that in the table. All four routes take into account segments with requirements for reduced noise levels. For example, such segments are bypassed. Figure shows the load between 0 and 50 of nodes between 1 and 37. For example, intersections for all three main routes during a day. Without the rerouting, the number of nodes that are maximally loaded is 10. Left figure, while rerouting, reduces the number to 5. Right figure. So, as a conclusion, we can say that the primary contribution of the work is a model of the system architecture for noise monitoring and traffic routing in the urban area as part of a smart city. The shortest path this algorithm that would be used by such architecture was considered. The approach of implementation of proposed IoT system architecture is given layer by layer, starting from the sensing nodes, perception layer, and wireless connectivity for data transfer, the transport layer. The proposed architecture is developed as a prototype. The evaluation of proposed routing modification is shown in the example of City of Zrenia in Serbia. The results of the experiments that include the length of the route segment, the time required to cross the segment noise and the time they show that the traffic congestion can be avoided, as well as route segments that pass through parts of the city where reduced noise levels are required. Some layers of IoT systems such as the application layer and the business layer are not covered with the paper and should be included in the future work. The future uh, work should include a detailed possible description of the application layer. At the end, I would like to say that uh, this research is partially funded by the Ministry for Scientific and Technological Development, Higher Education and Information Society of Republic of Srpska, uh, with one project, and also partially funded with the Ministry of Education, Science and Technological Development of the Republic of Serbia, uh, within another project. Uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. My name is Dalibor Dobilovic and if you want to uh, ask us any question, you can use the contacts shown in this slide. Thank you again.
My name is Miroslavovic from the Faculty of Transport and Traffic Sciences, University of Zagreb. Today I will present a paper, The Benefits of Open Data in Urban Traffic Network. My presentation will be divided in five uh, short uh, parts. Present situation about open data and big data in the world, where I will shortly describe the situation about open data development and uh, implementation. After that, I will present the status of open data with uh, legal aspects in uh, Croatia. Next, I will say a few words about open data principles and open data usage in traffic and transport in Croatia, and what benefits can be achieved uh, with the usage of open data in urban traffic network. So, uh, for the introduction, uh, in traffic network, a large amount of data can be collected from real systems and can be used in real time or subsequently for various goals in scientific research, improvement of uh, traffic network, public uh, transport systems, policy makings and similar fields. Commonly, end users but also other third party users uh, such as operators, manufacturers, researchers and others are in the great need of open data sets which must be correctly stored and presented. Regarding this, uh, usage and uh, reusage of uh, open and big data must be allowed and achieved. And the main goal is that uh, collected data and defined data sets must be open uh, to use. So, according to this, the main goal of this paper is to analyze the amount of uh, open data provided and to point to the lack of the same because uh, there are many situations where uh, the same data is collected and processed uh, two or more times without each party knowing that the other has already that data. In the world uh, and uh, advanced uh, countries of uh, Euro European uh, Union, there is already a large amount of active open uh, data portals regarding traffic and transport where some basic and even advanced and more complex uh, data sets are open for distribution. But also, some data sets are available for a fee. Uh, but there is in general the need of uh, open data usage and reusage. For example, the traffic data sets can be used for understanding user journey patterns, such as origin and destination of travel, which transport mode is uh, commonly used uh, in uh, which traffic network situation, etc. So, uh, just to say, traffic data sets can be also used to provide a better insight of the user needs for traffic network planning, achieving new ideas and solutions. Uh, open data in Croatia. So, in Croatia, there is a national open data portal where all available open data sets are collected and sorted for the use. But the real collection of raw data is performed by Croatian Bureau of Statistics, which collects transport statistics that include uh, data used for strategic traffic development of the country and to enhance it in terms of uh, investment planning in new infrastructure. So, it is necessary to consolidate uh, large data sets so that the traffic system should be more attractive to use. Uh, <clears throat> as for legal aspect, there are several documents that indicate uh, measures and activities regarding open data such as Croatian strategy for the development of public administration, eCroatia 2020 strategy, open government partnership action plan, anti-corruption strategy from uh, 2015 to 2020. So, the fun fact uh, is so to say that uh, Croatia was the only uh, European Union member until 2018 that uh, did not adopt uh, full access to open data through a unified policy at national level. As said before, uh, uh, if you go uh, back to the European Union level, there are four basic principles defined. 
open by default, uh, which means that public sector data must be available and easily accessible, <coughs> and that uh, it's mostly made uh, public. Second <coughs> is uh, time, uh, timeliness and complete, uh, completeness, which means that the policy should encourage uh, the publication of as many data sets as possible with the best insight into the content of the data, uh, which also must be up to date uh, with the possibility to give a feedback about the quality. Also, data sets must be available to the widest range of uh, users with the ease of retrieving, downloading, uh, indexing and searching them. The exchange of all open data sets must be achieved uh, and cooperation between different sectors must be achieved also. Some data uh, is available uh, in uh, the Republic of Croatia regarding the road and rail transport modes and also for uh, urban uh, transport. But those data are isolated with a low level of openness and uh, are not detail with, uh, detailed with uh, metadata. That's the main problem in the Republic of Croatia because um, several uh, institutions have their own uh, collected data which are basically not shared with other institutions regarding uh, research or um, manufacturing, producing of uh, uh, some sort of uh, services uh, and so on. Uh, from this paper, uh, it is pretty obvious that uh, open data has definitely a lot of benefits and uh, as it is written, open data is an important resource for the development of a modern digital European society and market, which is at least 75.7 .7 billion uh, of euros and uh, will potentially open the possibility of new employment for 25,000 workers. Regarding traffic science and research, uh, open data can be presented in three main categories urban planning, transportation operations, and traffic safety. And for conclusion, the potential of open data in traffic is uh, really promising uh, and uh, necessary. Mm, but as said before, the current level of open data usage in Croatia is still uh, at its beginning. European Union directives and other policies are forced in Croatia to boost the usage of open data concept in all fields, but the progress is still slow so that the um, near future uh, should be focused on implementation of open data concept. Uh, thank you for uh, your attention and because uh, uh, of these special circumstances, you can uh, ask your questions on uh, displayed contacts uh, of authors. Thank you and goodbye.
Hello everyone, I am Peter Kačmári and I work at Technical University in Košice, Faculty Berg at the Institute of Logistics and Transport. Welcome to my presentation of the paper Case Study in Logistics, Purchase Planning of Goods for Large Retail Chains, Taking into Account Sale Marketing Campaigns. It is about the forecasting of future sales during normal sale period and sell during the advertising campaign when the products have reduced their prices. So during these periods when there is a price advantage is expected bigger sale quantities and this presented case study proposed methodology how to forecast these quantities. Now small background info about the company for which this research was done. The retail, change, uh, the retail cha chain ABC, com uh, ABC stores, well, I'm sorry that I cannot present the real name of the company, which is uh, intentionally changed for publishing purpose, is the largest retail chain in the UK and currently operates more than 830 stores worldwide and employs around 500,000 people. ABC Stores is one of the most developed retail chain in Slovak Republic. It has been operating since uh, 1996 and currently operates network of 150 shop stores in Slovakia. Since 2005, the company has been providing customer service through a modern distribution center in Betsko, a textile warehouse in Senec, which is not only for Slovakia, but for all ABC stores in Central Europe, for example, Hungary, Poland, and Czech Republic. ABC stores has more than 9,900 employees and is one of the largest employees in, employer in uh, Slovakia. The main goal of the company is to provide the customer with the best and become a business for everyone. Now something important uh, about the methodology. What is the main principle of this research? The most important part is the different approach to the analysis of past sale of given product item. So there are two modes of forecasting. First one is normal sale. The product is not listed in the advertising leaflet. You may know that each bigger retail chain publishes a leaflet, usually one a week, with the products in price discounts. So products which are not listed in the leaflet are sold with normal price. And second mode is sale uh, or are uh, sales during the advertising campaign. So the products are listed in the advertising leaflet. Thus the forecast of uh, a since time series of one product sale will have double result. Now about the methods. There, there are three classical methods which were used for forecasting of future sale. First one is general known linear regression. This method was chosen especially for analysis of trends. The second one, exponential smoothing, is the system of exponential smoothing uses uh, the way of evaluating observations or data. The rule is followed that the latest observations or the latest data will usually provide the freshest information for creating an image of the future. So it offers a weighing system uh, that assigns descending weights to older observations or data. And third one is Holt methods or Holt's methods. This method allows to respect the emerging trends in forecasting while using exponential smoothing. So, well, it is a kind of exponential smoothing too. To define the objectivity and accuracy of the forecast, MMA PE tool was designed. It is based on the principle of the well-known MAPE indicator, which means the mean absolute percentage error, 
But for this purpose, it was determined MMAPE, modified mean absolute percent error, which was created. See formula below. And now, results. I have chosen one of several products which was the forecast for which was the forecast calculated. More products are described in the paper. There you can see the time series of one milk packet in uh, the Trapac. The first graph displays normal sale and the second displays the sales in the price campaign. Well, the price or the quantity of uh, sales in the uh, price campaign is higher, as you can see. Here are the tables of the forecasts. So, uh, from this chosen product, one milk in Tetra Pak. The first column shows the real value when it is comparable with the forecasting. And the MMAPE indicator is a little bit higher due changeable sale during the weeks, periods of normal sale. But MMAPE indicator is smaller in the second table, and it is in real good value when, sell in, when sales in the price campaign. You can see the bold numbers which indicates methods is the closest to the real value. So sale during the campaign is smoother than sales during the normal prices or normal periods. That's why the MMAPE indicator is, is lower when campaign. And now general results, which uh, shows that the, there are all of the research products with the results of uh, forecast. And now you can compare with MMAPE indicator. There is a table with all products chosen to the research. And this first table is about the comparison of the results among the foods item forecast at normal sale. Now you can see also the worst uh, MMAPE indicator for yogurt because the quantity of sale of the exact time of yogurt from this wide range of other similar yogurts with a different made was very low. The numbers sold are very low. That is why the MMAPE indicator is such high. And it also resulted to big value uh, at other items too. And the second table of uh, general results shows the food in the forecast in the campaign prices. This table shows also more accurate forecasts of all items than previous table. It means that the sale during the price campaign is smoother and it is easier to forecast the future quantity of sale. And also the bold number indicates which methods came closest to the real value. Butter holds method. Milk holds method. ATC. Thank you very much for your attention. More details of the presented case study can be seen in my paper. Thank you.
Hello everyone, welcome to presentation of the paper Methods of Increasing Warehouse Capacity in an Enterprise Case Study. Warehousing of goods is one of the most important subsystems of the logistic system in a company. It covers the storage of goods of various types and proper ties for various periods of time. A warehouse is a place where multiple activities are carried out depending on the warehouse function and position within the logistic systems of a company or in its supply system. The main purpose of the present article is to propose the methods of increasing the current static capacity of a selected warehouse of returnable packaging by using 
existing regs, installing new regs, and with the current or new handling, handling technology. An important parameter of, the, of, uh, of a warehouse is the warehouse capacity. The warehouse capacity depends on several parameters, primarily on the properties of goods, products, the storage unit size, the type of storage facility, and the handling or manipulation technology, the storage methods, and the warehouse layout. We distinguish between the warehouse's static capacity and the warehouse dynamic capacity. Methodology. The warehouse static capacity, WSC, presents the number of storage unit, units that may be stored in a warehouse at the same time. For the existing warehouses, such capacity is calculated on the basis of the REC system parameters using a simple formula you can see now. Figure presents an example of a rack field consisting of three levels and each rack cell there are two storage units, including the parameters of the main rack field and the additional rack field. Another important parameters or parameter is also the area of the rack assembly, rack system, RR, AR, that is calculating using formula. In order to achieve the objective defined in the, in the introduction, increasing the current static capacity, the first step is to calculate the WCS uh, SC capacity, uh, parameter using the formula 1 on the basis of the analysis of the current situation, the analysis of the parameters of storage units and the analysis of the parameters of the installed rack system, the rack size cell, number of storage units in the rack, number of level in a rack field, number of rack fields, and arrangement of rack in the warehouse premises. The second step is to determine the condition under which it is necessary to propose increasing the capacity. The last step is to make the decision while considering the selected parameters, for example, investment costs, execution time, ATC, on which the provided possibilities is acceptable in the given conditions. Returnable packaging is plastic boxes, KLT, which are placed on plastic pellets, 1200 by 800 by 145 millimeters. So standard Euro pellets. In the storage area, there is a rack system, which the racks arrange in one row and two rows. The warehouse contains seven racks. Each rack is consists of 32 fields. The rack comprises three levels. It means three rack cells. The current capacity of the rack system calculated using the formula is 1344 pellets.
Now you can see the current warehouse layout. The rack system area is 289.4 meters square, which is 30% of the warehouse area. A 5% overload of the warehouse was found on average. Proposed possibilities of increasing the current capacity in order to increase the capacity, four options were proposed. Option A. Elimination of the widest aisle A1 figure 3. This figure shows the elimination of the widest aisle by arrangement of the first current double row of racks and installing of new racks. The proposal will increase the capacity of 72 pallets places 5.4%. In this way, only the current overload of the warehouse is covered. Version A2. New rack will be replaced in the white area. See figure 4. The capacity of the warehouse will increase by 192 pallets, 14.3%, and Elvis uh, found be reduced to 2,558 millimeters by installing a new rack. The disadvantage of this solution is that the new L's uh, width is not suitable for the currently used forklift. For this proposal, it is necessary to change a forklift. In this way, the current overload of the warehouse is covered, but there is no 25% capacity increase. The increase of the capacity, version B, Decrease of the current rack cell high. Decrease of the current rack cell high from 1,500 mm to only 1,000 mm. The decrease of the height of the rack cell can be installed fourth level rack field. The adjust end rack field would facilitate the storage of eight pallets. Originally, it was six pallets. In this partic uh, particular case, an increase in the capacity represents 448 pallets, a 33% in increase. This capacity increase will be sufficient for the planned increase in production. The increase of the capacity, C variant, exchange of handling equipment. The current forklift is exchanged by a three-way electric pallet stacker truck. This type of truck requires less space, narrower aisles, and when handling pallets. In figure five, it is shown the warehouse layout after the forklift type change. In this case, existing rack would be arranged and three new racks would be installed. This proposal will increase warehouse capacity by 700, uh, 576 pallets, places 43%. This capacity increase will be sufficient for the planned increase in production. The increase of the warehouse static capacity will be achieved by Proposal B and Proposal C for the planned increase in production about 25%. The implementation of both proposals is time-consuming and physically demanding work. For Proposal B, it is necessary to adjust the rack cell to a height of 1000 mm. This proposal requires costs, cost of purchasing of new uh, 448 beams, two beams per rack cell, and the cost of work performed relocation of existing new beams. Proposal C, however, it is necessary to arrange the existing rack 
and install new ones. Necessary costs are the cost of purchase of uh, and installing new racks, the cost of work performed, and the cost of purchase of a new forklift truck. The proposal A2 is also interesting, although it does not meet the requirements, it has its advantage as well. In a particular case, proposal A2, there may be a first step in increasing warehouse capacity. The second step would be proposal B or C. By combining the two uh, the proposals, would uh, have increased the capacity of the full Loving, of the following 407 pallets, combination A2 and B, 768 uh, pallets, combination A2 and C. This is more than 50 of current capacity, 50% of current capacity. Conclusion. The expected investment costs for the purchase and installation of new racks is 20,000 euros at the most expensive auction C. The change of the truck can be realized by using the possibility of operation leasing with the possi uh, possibility of a full service or a long-term lease. Thank you very much for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mateusz Kurowski and I would like to present you the article I wrote in cooperation with Katarzyna Hook. We represent the University of Zielona Góra. The title of the article is The Use of Telematics System in Transport and Forwarding Management. The current market situation has slowed down this trend, but it will be another real threat in the coming years. The solution to the lack of employees will be IT systems used in transport and forwarding, such as autonomous tracks running and on autopilot or without a driver, telespeditors, systems replacing the work of freight forwarders, etc. The other important problem is the increase in demand for transport services among companies that perform sporadic transports and they cannot fully control these freight. This one can be solved by using advanced IT systems for the transport and forwarding industry. The aim of the article is to analyze telematics systems 
used in transport and forwarding and to propose improvements in the form of central solutions. The article is literal, empirical and based on the analysis of the publications on the subject and on research. The idea of telematic systems. Telematics is a part of telecommunications dealing with issues related to the transmission of messages in the form of a static image, alphanumeric text, graphics, characters, photographs, and other objects. The figure presents a diagram of information flow in a typical telematic system. A telematic system meeting basic location and communication services should have an object position determination system and information transfer system to the control center. Automatic position determination without the operator's control can be done by determining geographical coordinates, GPS, and comparing these positions with the map, pinpointing the position of the mobile station, GPS, or by reading the position from transmitters or markers via microwave, infrared, or electromagnetic transporters. It should be noted that under the term telematics systems, we will now distinguish much more systems than can indicate the location of cars. However, the use of the GPS system is still the most popular and the most common in use among the sector. Now we move forward to the research and its results. We surveyed 200 companies and 60 of them represented transport sector and 140 entities were from different sectors. The group consisted of 28 micro companies, 56 small companies, 64 medium companies and 52 large companies. 12 entities operate on local market, 20 inside specific region, 24 within the country, 120 realize freight on multinational level, and 24 companies are characterized as global. The use of systems supporting transport management. Respondents were asked identified transport systems used in their organization. The most frequently used systems by transport companies include GPS, freight exchanges, route accounting, work time management, fleet management, fuel accounting. However, among the other companies most commonly used are GPS, ERP, work time management. The conducted survey also analyzed the type of used GPS system. Transport companies to, get to the greatest extent use external or dedicated devices that track GPS systems and can indicate the location of a given vehicle in real time. Currently, all truck manufacturers are installing GPS sensors in their vehicles. Unfortunately, the problem arises when it comes to the possibility of locating all transportation units in one program. The inability to identify all cars in real time is indicated by a small percentage of transport companies. It's 5.4%. But in the group of the non-transport companies, this is the case of a half of entities. There is a significant problem on the side of logistics service recipients. Companies can only identify the location of their fleet or vehicles of regular contractors. It is also possible to identify transportation units through transport exchanges, but in most cases, it requires the use of two systems. Things get more complicated when using several transport exchanges. Recipients of logistic services who use transport services 
would like to be able to track rented means of transport. This is the matter of necessity and the ability to identify all vehicles in one telematic system. This issue was covered by the research in the area of the possibilities and needs of development of transport systems. In order to analyze the studied phenomenon, an index analyzes an, an average percentage share of the indicated answers in the survey questionnaire, according to the arithmetic average, were carried out. The research shows that the transport companies make the most use of systems dedicated to this industry, 90.5% of answers including many of them using telematic systems based on GPS, 94.7%. It should be noted that among non-transport companies, the percentage of use of this type of so software is also high, as much as 90.5% of them indicated that they use systems dedicated for transport, and 39.3% use telematic systems. On average, 30% for transport and 11.7% for non-transport companies, software used in the organization is dedicated to transport. Analyzing the indicator of the degree of the use of transport systems in relation to other management programs, it is 47% for transport and 41% for non-transport entities. This result depends on a large number of programs dedicated to transport and comprehensive enterprise management solutions. Regarding the degree of utilization of telematic systems, the indicator for transport companies is at the level of 4% and is significantly lower than in non-transport companies, which is 12%. This can be explained by the fact that Telematic systems represent a small share of the transport system market. The lower indicator's value is, the stronger it will indicate the use of the other systems dedicated for transport and forwarding. It is also important to answer the question, what are the factors determining the use of telematic systems? For the needs of the analysis, a probit model was created describing the probability of using a telematic system in an enterprise based on the entity surveyed for the research. The probit statistical probability model is used when the dependent variable assumes limited values, in this case it is two level. In the study it is assumed that the value of one means the use of a telematic system in the company while zero means it was not implemented. In this particular model, three independent variables were implemented. First one is the size of the company, classified into four groups based on the number of employees, micro company, small company, medium company, and large company. The second was business sector, indicated only two groups of entities, transport plus forwarding companies and others. The third variable was the number of countries where the company provides services or sells products. It was range. <clears throat> the probit model was computed using GRED software and the results are presented in the table. The model has predicted correlation, correction on the level of 80%. The obtained results indicate the, that the activity in the transport sector increases, the chains of using the telematic systems also the increase in enterprise size has a positive impact on the use of telematics. The probability increases by 29.49% as the company increases in size by one class. The, the impact of both described variables turned out to be statistically significant in contrast to the last parameter, which was the company's range. 
The expansion of operations by one country increases the chance of using telematics by 0.78%. This relationship was not statistically significant. Therefore, it turned out that the use of telematic systems was not related to the range of activity of the surveyed enterprises. The most important was the fact of carrying out transport as the core activity, and the supporting factor was the size of the company, indirectly related to substantial investment opportunities and a greater, greater number of transport operations. Transport monitoring and controlling using central control IT systems. Most companies struggle with the lack of real-time control and tracking of vehicles by using only one telematic system. Each unit is equipped with pre-installed telematic systems, but also uses various types of additional software. The usual software used to control the transport fleet is that which operate through sensors installed inside the vehicles. Transportation units are fitted with GPS tracking systems and fuel consumption probes at the request of the company owner. Then the GPS sensor and probe synchronize with the software installed in, in the computer in the office. Thanks to this, the owner is able to locate all his vehicles in real time. The problem with tracking may occur when using external means of transport, for example by using a forwarding company or trusted carriers recommended or hired through freight exchange. Then it is impossible to control the cars. In addition, the implementation of GPS systems in the entire fleet generates further costs. The use of GPS systems, which is currently installed by every truck manufacturer in their vehicles, is important. The key solution would be to implement a central telematic system throughout supply chains. This figure presents the simplified supply chain with an indication of the services of transport and forwarding companies and information intermediaries, for example, transport exchanges, freight forwarding. It should be noted that in the case of subsequent resale of transactions on freight exchanges, the company can only act as an intermediary or forwarder. It does not necessarily have to carry out transport. Nevertheless, we deal with such situations in transport sector. The key point of the proposed system would be transferring the location of individual vehicles directly to recipients of logistic services. The first platforms with such solutions are beginning to appear in Poland, for example, CO3. Their task will be to indicate the location after identifying the GPS sensor regardless of its type. The main problem concerns finding real-time location of all vehicles in one system. There are many programs that support the location's finding feature, but they require devices mounted physically inside the transportation unit. Although vehicles are equipped with internal GPS systems, they cannot be located in one program. There are no complex transport management systems which could play the same role as ERP systems for the company's management. On the other side of the service are customers who have rented a particular vehicles to transport their goods. They also need unrestricted and rapid access to the information about real-time locations of their freight. This is another area for development. Thank you for your attention. Do not hesitate to contact us if you have any questions or remarks.
Well, dear ladies and gentlemen, I'm glad to present you today my scientific paper with the title Mobile Picking Robots, um, First Study of the Effects of Human-Robot Interactions in Conventional Order Picking Systems. So my name is Dirk Hauker. I'm a research associate at the Technical University of Munich, and I work at the Chair of Materials Handling, Material Flow Logistics. Like the title says, um, I will talk about um, mobile picking robots in the next 15 to 20 minutes, and especially how those robots will affect our future warehouses and uh, how they affect our working behavior and how we need to plan those new hybrid systems in which um, things will take place in the future. Our warehouses are getting more and more robotized. So what does it mean? Um, if you have a look in newer warehouses or bigger warehouses, you will find at least one kind of robotic system. This isn't really new. Like if you look uh, in the past, the first AGVs were developed uh, two or three decades ago. Um, after a while, um, the usage was less, especially in the late 90s and um, at the beginning of 2000, more and more robots are getting back into the systems, especially because they're getting smarter. Um, the internet connections and, and all that is getting better and faster, so you can use it more reliable and um, everything else. If we have a closer look into warehouses and especially warehouses like Amazon or any other kind of e-commerce warehouses, uh, you will find a specific new system. Uh, the first company who introduced this kind of system was Kiva Robotics um, in the mid of 2000. Um, and after a couple of years, they got acquired by Amazon and nowadays it's called Amazon Robotics um, and, and something you will find a lot of in the newspapers since Amazon is one of the biggest uh, companies in the world. Um, it gets more and more interesting if they implement this kind of robots. Uh, nevertheless, there are different other companies who offer uh, this kind of robots. For example, uh, some companies from the US as well as companies from Europe. Um, for example, Magazino, which is a Munich company or Swiss Lock, um, but as well as I am Robotics or Fetch Robotics. And like I said, there are tons of others and, uh, and nowadays who can either uh, produce this or that kind of robot. Anyways, the main question is what effect does the use of mobile picking robots have on the operation of the existing manual picking system? So how those robots will affect our future work, how they affect the work with humans, how they affect the actual work of humans. And this is something I would like uh, to present you. This is my research field and I would like to present you some parts of it today. So first of all I will give you a quick overview of the nowadays uh, uh, literature. Uh, afterwards I will go into a more detailed um, in, in my model. Afterwards I will show you some results and um, then I will close this presentation with a conclusion and an outlook. Well, um, since Amazon bought Kiva Robotics um, 15, no, 10 years ago, um, you can see a rise of um, scientific papers who discuss this kind of systems. Uh, nowadays, it's called Robotic Mobile Fulfillment Center, 
and um, there you, you find different kind of papers who discuss different strategies, how you can improve performance, how you can manage those thousands of robots in a warehouse, stuff like that. Um, on the other hand, like those are the movable racks. On the other hand, you have systems with still static racks, uh, like you usually have in a warehouse. Uh, you can differ between pick support HEVs and mobile pick HEVs. Like the name already says it, the pick support doesn't really pick, they just support the human with like transportation or like showing them where to pick, how many and uh, different kind of other informations. On the other hand, the mobile pick HEVs um, are able to pick by itself, so they are autonomously and autonomous agents in the system and they can um, implement it and, and use like humans uh, with some restrictions we will see later on. Um, in this kind of field like um, HEV based picking with static regs you won't find that many papers though. So there are some um, but either they don't really consider human robot interactions or on the other hand they don't really use a planning approach how to plan those systems and they are not really a basis for suitable operating strategies. So this is why I would like uh, to show you my model I designed and first of all I would like to look into the layout, um, which is basically the heart of um, every order picking system. You can see here um, different parts of the layout. The green squares you see at the bottom are the depots uh, where the human or the, the robot uh, starts and end every tour. Um, so they're getting their, their orders, they repack something, they get a new wagon, um, different kind of processes. Uh, the blue squares are the shelves, so in those squares there are the, the actual products where the agents need to go to pick, and the gray squares are basically the, the, the walking area, and which can um, differ in a pre-zone, which is uh, basically the zone between the depot and the end of the first shelves, and um, different cross aisles um, depending on the layout. Uh, so the back cross aisle would mean you can enter uh, or leave an aisle at both sides, and so you you, you are able to to have a traversal walking strategy. If you would not have this back cross aisle. Uh, you can just enter the upper aisles um, and then leave the aisles at the same position. So it's basically a return strategy. Um, furthermore, the, the, the model is able to build layouts which have a depot on the left hand side. So you, you, you split basically um, the layout in the middle and then you would enter the the aisle, for example, in this way, or this way, or this way, if you would have the depot on the left-hand side. And with that, uh, we are able to build every kind of classic layout um, in our system. So, um, this is the, the overview. Let's have a look into a more deep um, part and those are the warning zones. So every agent has a specific defined security zone. Um, the robot has a 360 degree zone and once another agent or an obstacle would enter this zone um, the robot will stop directly. This is something you will find in the real world as well. Um, it's, it's just a safety thing. 
that you don't hurt especially other humans or you don't like destroy uh, the robot so this field is basically 360 degrees around the robot um, the human on the other hand just have a security zone in front of him um, this is why or that this is just because we say a human would not stop if another human passes by him um, on another um, field for example on, on, on this field a human would walk from the right hand side to the left hand side uh, both human wouldn't stop because they still have enough space uh, comparable with uh, something you might know from walking through aisles in a supermarket uh, where you would probably not stop um, if someone comes in the, to your direction but on the other side of the aisle uh, you would just stop or overpass someone um, if the person comes right in your direction or stays at some point um, so this is um, basically how we implemented the warning zones and then I would suggest we have a look into the results well the design of experience you can see here um, if you would like to have a more detailed explanation of the different parameters uh, I can refer to the written paper right now uh, to short things up um, I will give you just a quick overview the main different um, experiments are either um, made with the aisle width so we have either a system which has aisles um, four meters or six meter wide um, we change um, if we have a backcross aisle and as well we change the number of agents um, between 1 to 20 so if we look first F onto the total throughput, throughput of homogeneous systems so that would be a human only or a robot only system you can see here the orders um, and the agents the top four graphs are the human only graphs the top uh, the, the the four below are the robot only graphs um, both the upper two graphs are um, systems with an six meet wide aisle and either with or without cross aisle this is the same down here and those two graphs here and those two graphs there are um, four meter wide aisles either with or without a back cross aisle so what you can see here is basically you reach a higher performance with a human only system compared to a robot only system which is basically nothing uh, surprisingly because a human is still faster it can pick faster stuff like that so it's supposed to work faster and reach a higher throughput on the other hand um, what you can see in both systems are that the six meter aisle systems are more even so you you have at the beginning the same basically throughput and afterwards it splits a bit and in the end gets together um, this means after um, a different kind of or a specific kind of agents it doesn't matter if you have a cross aisle or you don't um, if you look at the four meter wide aisles you see a fluctuation of the throughput this can explain by the fact that four meters would mean a higher interaction that means um, it depends on the simulation run where you get more um, or higher throughput and afterwards you get a 
lower throughput um, just because of more or less interactions. So in this case we can say the 6 meter wide aisle gets a higher throughput on the one hand and it is less it has a less fluctuation of the throughput. If we look at the average performance, um, you can see that the same thing basically. Um, the human has a higher average performance. It decreases um, over more participants. Um, this should be clear because even in a human only system, a human only system, um, you get more and more interactions which costs time and then you lose that time to do the actual work, namely um, picking. What you can see as well is that the decrease is steeper at the human compared to the robot. This is because the human of the um, because of the higher um, picking quote the human loses more of its performance regarding to the robot if we look now into a combination of all possible participants um, it gets more and more interesting so what you can see here is on this axis the number of robots on this axis the number of humans and still on the x-axis the number of orders and every um, bar um, shows one specific um, combination for example here 7 and 10 and it shows the total orders so and if you look for example, to meet a throughput of 2000 orders, uh, you can see that this will be possible with different kind of systems. So basically with every system which reaches out um, this red zone. And this is still one interesting and one very a difficult question so which of those systems are the best so what is actually the best would it be the less cost or still the highest performance or whatever so this is something um, what we are working on right now to figure out what is basically the best in this kind of field anyways um, there's still the question, can we push this um, performance by any strategies that we would change or implement into the system? And one interesting strategy would be the results strategy, um, the zoning strategy, uh, which means we um, place only human in one part of the system and the robots into another part and see if it affects positively or negatively our performance. So what you can see now is in an even system, so if we have like an even number of um, humans and robots, for example 6-6 six, six or 10-10 ten, ten or something like that, uh, you see a rise of the performance. Once you look into a system which is uneven, for example, one human and ten robots, you see it decreases just because all of the ten work in this two aisles, for example, and um, the one human has two aisles for itself. So, same thing over here. Um, if you um, set up only human and maybe just one or two robots. Uh, so as long as you have an even an even number of participants within the system, the zoning might work very well. Now I will end my presentation with a conclusion and outlook. So 
the need of an independent investigation of hybrid OPS has been demonstrated. Um, zoning offers a strategy to improve performance. Um, besides zoning, though, there sh are uh, other strategies which need to be um, reviewed. Um, I'm working right now on some um, very interesting strategies. And like I said before, furthermore, for example, financial indicators have to be implemented to evaluate an economic operation. Well, I very thank you for your attention and um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Marco Matulin, and I'm here to present a paper titled How Frustrated Are You? User Perception About Different Video Conference Quality Degradations. Before I start with my presentation, allow me to introduce you to other two co-authors, Stefze Mervel and Borna Abramovic. We are all from University of Zagreb, Faculty of Transport and Traffic Sciences, and we have experience working with uh, analyzing quality of service of different services, not only in uh, telecommunications, but also in, uh, for instance, public transport. So moving forward to introduction, first I would like to talk about how we ended up on this path. COVID-19 crisis helped us to choose this research path on which we embarked because obviously uh, during this lockdown measures and the whole uh, situation we ended up working online and in this work environment we often use video conferencing tools but uh, COVID-19 aside we were also motivated by uh, our curiosity to investigate what are user habits and environmental characteristics of the users when they are using the video conferencing. And of course, we wanted to learn more about quality of experience for video conferencing and how it is related to quality of service. About video conference market, just briefly in numbers, in December 2019, Zoom recorded uh, 10 million users per month on average and this number increased to 200 million at the beginning of 2020. According to SkillScouter, by the end of this year the market will be worth around 6.4 billion US dollars. So on the previous slide I talked about how quality of experience and quality of service are two major terms which are important for our work. And here is uh, one of the mostly accepted definitions of quality of experience, which says that quality of experience is the degree of delight or annoyance of the user of an application or service. It results from the fulfillment of his or her expectations with respect to the utility and or enjoyment of the application or service in the light of the user's personality and current state. Specific words are underlined in this definition because they are important to understand that quality actually has two different aspects. You have the objective aspect of quality where the focus is more on quantitative network parameters which can be measured, such as latency, packet loss and jitter. Due to its characteristics, a lot of work has been done also regarding video coding techni techniques for video conferencing service and video streaming methods. But as we see from the definition of quality of experience, the focus is more on the subjective perspective of, you, of users. And here on this side, we want to analyze the end user opinions, experiences and perception of the service quality. So the most frequent topic in the literature is the relationship between quality of service and quality of experience. Significant attention was also given to the modeling of user QOE for video conference. And some researchers are focused more on evaluating video conference platforms as a collaboration tool. So now moving forward to what we actually did in this research. We designed an online questionnaire on the Lime survey platform. The questionnaire contained five question categories. In the first category, we only had one question which was, have you been using the video conferencing tools and applications recently? If the test subject answered negatively, he or she was disqualified from the survey and the survey ended. If they responded yes, then they were given the opportunity to participate in the rest of the survey. 
And in the section two, we ask them typical demographic data, age group, gender, and so on. In the third category, we investigated from where users usually connect to their online meetings, on which type of devices, on which type of network, and we also suggested one hypothetical scenario, which I will talk about later. In the fourth category, we wanted to learn more about a typical online meeting scenario. What is, for instance, the most common purpose of the meeting? What is the most common application used? And what is the user's typical role in the meeting? Because we were curious about if these degradations of quality are perhaps differently perceived depending on the user role. And in the fifth category, we had questions aimed towards discovering user opinions about uh, the meeting quality itself. We investigated which parameters are essential for a good quality meeting and how frustrating it is to experience specific quality degradations during the meeting. More about the survey. The survey lasted for one month. We collected 541 fully completed questionnaires regarding the respondents' gender. It's roughly 50-50, females and males. You can also see the age group distribution on the slide. And on the picture here, uh, you can see that most of our test subjects are well familiarized with the video conferencing because over the past month and when I say past month I mean from the time when they were completing the questionnaire most of them participated in the online meetings quite a big portion of our test subjects participated over six times and some participants even over 40 times uh, in one month. So what we learned from our survey? Well, first, something about user environments. We asked them what is the most common device used for the meetings, and we actually provided them with the four types of devices and asked them to rank them by their frequency of using it as a device for video conferencing. And as you see from the image on top right, laptop is the most common used device for video conferencing. This is the most frequently ranked as number one device. Desktop computer was also ranked as a number one device by close to 20% of our test subjects. The most frequently ranked device on the second place was smartphone, which is visible here. We were somewhat surprised to discover this because we thought that smartphone is maybe not so convenient for video conferencing, especially in the work environment. But from our survey, we see that the smartphone is the device most frequently ranked second. From our survey, we also discovered that most of our test subjects connect to the internet on the Wi-Fi or the DSL network. So from these two facts, we can infer that the most typical user environment from where they are participating in the meetings are somewhat like this. Now I want to talk about one hypothetical scenario which we proposed in the survey. The scenario goes like this. You are in the front of your commonly used device for the meetings. The device is connected to the internet as you described. You are not currently in the meeting and you just want to watch, for example, a YouTube video from your favorite channel. And after this scenario, we proposed several statements and the test subjects were required to say if they agree or disagree with these statements. So the statements are 
shown on this graph. So basically all of these statements are here to help us discover if the network environment of the user is not sufficient for this type of service. And we see from the graph that the majority of the test subjects responded negatively to these statements. So we can conclude that the environment from where the test subjects usually participate in the video conference is suitable for that type of service. So in the typical video conferencing scenario, we wanted to learn what is the most common purpose of the user's meeting. And again, we provided different purposes and ask test subjects to rank them. And as you can see, the purpose most frequently ranked as number one was to discuss stuff with my colleagues at work, followed by to attend or give lectures, and followed by to see my friends and relatives. Other purposes were least likely ranked as number one. From this, we can see that as we could assume, of course, the video conferencing tool is most commonly used for work. Next graph will show you which applications are most commonly used and Zoom meetings is the most commonly used application by our test subjects. This is followed by Microsoft Teams, Skype, Adobe Connect and so on. And the final graph on this slide, we wanted to learn more about typical meeting roles. And as we see from the graph, the most frequent role of our test subjects is a presenter. Second, we have participant, sometimes a presenter, which is followed by I'm only a participant. Now about quality of experience. This graph shows you how our test subjects agree or disagree regarding these statements. The statements are here to indicate which aspect of quality is more important to our test subjects. Do they prefer more sound over image quality or uh, screen sharing quality or design of the application, etc. The one thing which is quite interesting is the last statement here, which says if the meeting participants are not familiarized with the application, the meeting itself can be frustrated. And as you can see, the vast majority of our test subjects strongly agree or just agree with this statement, indicating that their experience is connected also to the knowledge of other video conferencing participants. Regarding which aspect of the quality is the most important, here on this image I have illustrated it. The high sound quality is by far the most important aspect of video conferencing service for our test subjects. It is more important than high image quality from screen sharing or webcams, and it is more important than having experienced users in the meeting. Next, we wanted to see how often certain degradations happen during the video conferencing. Now this is this question is related with the previous question when I talked about the network environment of our test subjects. Like I said, we can conclude that the majority of test subjects had the network conditions suitable for video conferencing. Nevertheless, we wanted to see if certain quality degradations occur in those types of network environment. So here on the left, you have different quality degradations. For instance, the image is blocky, the image is blurred, 
and we wanted to see how often these quality degradations occur. As expected, majority of these degradations never happen or happen rarely for our test subjects. However, if they occur, we wanted to see how frustrating it is to our test subjects. So on the right subplot, you can see per each quality degradation how frustrating it is for our test subjects to experience them. And you can see that for the vast majority of our test subjects, there are specific quality degradations which are most frustrating and those are when they get disconnected. Majority of test subjects are quite frustrated or frustrated to the max. Another quite badly perceived degradation is the echo in the sound, where majority of respondents are moderately frustrated, frustrated or frustrated to the max. So this green, purple and turquoise color and so on. So we can see that although the degradations are rarely happen, when they do, it can really hurt the experience. And the last slide before I conclude is the slide where I want to show you how user role in the meeting significantly affects their experience if they are under the influence of some quality degradations. So you can see here that the share of quite frustrated or frustrated to the max people during video conferencing while speaking is 66%, while listening is 53 So again, this quality degradation, disconnections from the meetings is the most adversely perceived degradation from all the degradation, degradations which we investigated. Echo in the sound is the second. The sound contains noise is the third. And surprisingly, our test subjects were not so adversely affected if other participants get disconnected. It was more hurtful if they are disconnected. You can also see that the majority of the high-ranked degradations is related to the sound, which is in line with our previous conclusion that the sound quality is more important than the image quality. So the degradations which are dealing with the image are actually on the bottom of this list. So to conclude and to talk about the outlook of our future research, well, we can say that while Conferencing, the users value more sound or image quality or video quality. The quality of experience depends on the knowledge of other conference peers and also on the meeting role of the users. Meeting disconnections are most adversely perceived by our respondents. And lastly, in the outlook of our future research, well, you saw from my presentation that uh, for now we only provided basic uh, statistics, but if we actually want to extract deeper knowledge from the survey, then we need to implement more sophisticated uh, statistical analysis. And this is something which we plan to do in the future. And also the results of this research we believe that we can use them to work on a model between quality of service and quality of uh, user experience. This is something which we are strongly passionate about. Here is the last slide. I thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, please write to me. Thank you and goodbye.
Dear ladies and gentlemen, my name is Jozef Maščenik and I would like to say many thanks to the organizers of this conference for the opportunity to present my work on dynamic load of teeth of cylindrical worm gear with my co-author Professor Slavko Pavlenko. Shortly outline our presentation, this paper presents theoretical and practical knowledge related to analysis of dynamic load of the individual drive elements containing worm gears. This paper describes general principles of worm gear systems and methods of creation of dynamic model of worm reducer or, or of an entire that drive. It indicates possibilities of reduction of dynamic load of a gear in the mode of frequent startups and halt of the drive. Introduction is divided into sections. Firstly, modern scientific researches in the field of design proposal and structure of machines move in direction of development of methods of phenomena analysis. The development is connected with the development of the branches as follows. General mechanics, mathematics, theory of optimization, mechanics of continuum, tribology, theory of stochastic processes, theory of reliability, experimental methods and methods of research of particular particular machines under actual operating conditions. And dynamics of machines perceived in the modern manner represents dynamics of systems requiring dual approach. Firstly, on the one hand, it is a detailed research of individual parts of the system and secondly, on the other hand, it is a complex analytical research of the entire system. Worm gears are designed to transfer torsional moment between skew shafts, mostly at right angle. From structural point of view, the worm gears are produced as independent nodes, which are fixed to a joint frame with driving machines or other driven machines or as an integrated structure with a drive or other parts of machines in a single unit as we can see on the presented figure. The, regarding dynamics of worm gears, despite the fact that worm gears are extensively applied in practice the professional literature only rarely offers publications related to research of the gears from the point of view of their dynamics. For the case of teeth meshing of cylindrical worm gear system, the more pos positive influence of dynamic effects during start of teeth meshing is presented in the literature. In case of mesh, of teeth of cylindrical worm gear systems, the relative speed of faces of teeth of worm is at an right angle of gamma, with gamma standing for lead angle of worm of pitch cylinder towards the direc direction of circumferential speed of worm wheel at pitch diameter. Except for the aforementioned, even circumferential speed of worm is several times higher than circumferential speed of worm wheel and therefore onset of faces of teeth of worm in onto wheel teeth is more continuous and lacks negative dynamic effects contrary to spur wheels. 
regarding experimental examination of mechanical systems, more obsolete methods of experimental examination of oscillation of tooth gears restate in monitoring of changes of torsional moments affecting the rotating shafts. Modern methods of experimental examination stem in measuring of response of structures or drives in their controlled actuation in the selected network of points on the surface. The assessed frequency transfers between the individual pairs of points serve for determination of modal frequencies and regressive calculation on the basis of measured data is used for determination of model shapes of oscillations. On the figure 2 we can see torsional stiffness of worm shaft and a related equation. On the third figure we can see torsional stiffness of shaft of worm wheel and also related equation. Mathematical and physical dynamic model on the basis of analysis of stiffness parameters of cylindrical worm gear the following, following mutual relation were detected. Firstly, due to higher gear ratio which is typical for worm gear after reduction per shaft of worm rather low reduced actual moment of inertia of the driven machine is achieved. Secondly, reduced mean, mean stiffness of toothing is lower or corresponds by order to torsional stiffness KTM. Third, reduced mean stiffness of toothing is higher contrary to reduced torsional stiffness KTB red or in case of average and larger, larger sizes the difference is expressed in orders. Fourth, with regards to a reduced actual moment of inertia of worm wheel I to red IM is higher. To get oriented the values of calculated stiffness for average size of gearbox UCG 160. The example is given on the bottom part of this slide. Regarding the influence of geometrical parameters upon inherent frequencies, by means of computing program which uses methods of impedance matrix mentioned the inherent frequencies of dynamic model of cylindrical worm drive were calculated as well as of dynamic model with worm drive. Detected was the influence of axial moment of inertia of worm wheel and of flexural stiffness of worm shaft upon change of inherent frequency of cylindrical worm drive. The results are plotted in presented uh, special graphs for the monitored gearbox. The axial moment of inertia as well as flexural stiffness was being changed with the range from 0.6 to 1.4 uh, times with regard to currently produced state. The influence is clear from this figure. Dynamic load of teeth of cylindrical worm gear is presented on the, on the figure 5 on this slide which shows development of values of efficiency eta 
for the UCG 160 gearbox. Philip K ranges from 0.0858 to 0.0835 for the individual gearbox types. Programs for dynamic analysis allow calculation of deviation, speed or acceleration in any random node of dynamic model. In a similar way it allows determination of force or moment in any random element of the model. Development of additional dynamic force was determi determined by, by implementation of external sinusoid unit force and by detection of value of additional dynamic force in toothing at random frequency of actuating force. Development is shown in the following figure for, for dynamic model. The values of relative dampings are indicated below this graph. To conclude, contrary to generally accepted opinion on absence of dynamic phenomena in worn gears, this paper provides detailed analysis of meshing process of teeth of worm wheel with worm threads and whether dynamic load is possible in worm gears as well. It has been shown that to alleviate and to prevent the impact, the elastic adjacent element should be located among the teeth of wheel, teeth and worm threads which would serve as a damper of impact system and at the same time it shall assure minimal coefficient of friction during relative slip of work areas of worm threads and teeth of worm wheel. The character of collision of worm threads and wheel teeth depends on type and properties of elastic adjacent element among wheel teeth and warm threads. Thank you for your attention.
Good day to all, my name is Petra Zoric and today I will present you a paper entitled Analysis of Available Information and Communication Solutions and Services for Railway Passenger Information in the EU. I wrote this paper with co-authors Matea Mikulcic, Mario Musa and Tibor Mio Kuljak. First of all, I will say something brief about myself. I'm currently employed as an assistant at the University of Zagreb Faculty of Transport and Traffic Sciences at the Department of Information and Communication Traffic. I'm also a PhD student and I'm developing my knowledge in the laboratory of security and forensic analysis of information communication systems, which is part of the mentioned department. My scientific work is focused on researching the possibility of applying information and communication services in different segments of the transport system. I also had a role in organizing this year's Management of Manufacturing Systems conference as a local chair. As you know, the conference was supposed to be held in Opatia, Croatia, but unfortunately, the coronavirus pandemic disrupted our plans. In order not to see Opatia on this slide, I'm just showing you what beauties we should all enjoy together on this day. I hope there will be opportunities for that in the near future. This review of the research consists of the following units. Introduction literature review, currently available information in communication sol solutions and services for railway passenger information in the EU, passenger information system Croatia versus EU best practices, and of course, conclusion. The ability to provide information and transport services anytime and anywhere makes the rail network more efficient and easier to use for end user. Real-time and accurate information is the most crucial item in informing passengers. The basis for obtaining this information is a stable and comprehensive passenger information system that uses a specific architecture to deliver the service. From the management point of view, the passenger information system is divided into the uh, source of information, central management level, the level of management in stations and on the train, and control equipment at stations and on the train. This research is focused on functionalities of currently available information and communication solutions and services that enable informing passengers in real traffic in the European Union. The analyses include passenger information systems in the EU countries with the highest realized uh, passenger traffic in the last year, measuring it in billions of passengers transported. The passenger information system is a solution for providing relevant real-time information to passengers. It is responsible for the automatic or manually programmed provision of visual and audio data to passengers at stations and stops. 
Mobile application-based passenger information systems are rapidly gaining ground due to the increased penetration of smartphone use and it is most common in passengers who use public transport. The development of information and communication in the transport sector has resulted in services focusing on customers and their needs by changing the previous perception of passenger transport. A 2020 Eurostat survey on the impact of rail passenger transport at the European Union level shows that the largest number of passengers in 2018 was carried in Germany, the United Kingdom and France. Analysis of the current scientific and professional literature shows a lack of research topics that focus on informing passengers on the railway network based on up-to-date technologies. The same goes for research at the national level. In the last few years in Croatia, informing passengers on the railway network has been expanding. The current passenger information system on the rail network in Germany, United Kingdom and France, which are developed according to the uh, technical specifications for inter interoperability guidelines and the regulation of the EU Commission can be divided into uh, passenger information systems before and during the trip. Passenger information systems before the trip include information uh, via the website and mobile applications. During the trip, passenger information systems refer to audio and visual information via screens in the stations themselves or at the stops. On the rail network of the infrastructure manager in Croatia, uh, HG infrastructure, out of a total of 545 stations and stops in Croatia, only 256 are equipped with the possibility of providing visual information for passengers. Of the 124 stations equipped with the listed equipment required to provide information, only six stations provide dynamic screens for displaying information to passengers, that is 1.4%. Most stations and stops have a passenger information system consisting of several subsystems, such as a classic fix timetable, boards as LED screens, clock subsystems, loudspeaker subsystems, uninterruptible power supply and communication equipment that allows all of it. The service of informing passengers at stations and stops is provided via loudspeakers or visually via fixed bulletin boards displaying the all-day timetable, such as a screen with information on the time and place of train, uh, arrival and departure, train delays, possible change of transport route and other necessary information related to uh, rail traffic. Data on railway lines exist in digital form on the passenger transport operator's website as well as on the mobile application. In the next few slides, you will see the comparison of the passenger information system features among Croatia and Germany, United Kingdom and France. The technology used and how information is displayed to passengers at stations and stops in the analyzed countries differs. Uh, this table shows the main differences between passenger information systems during the trip. According to a comparison of the passenger information system features during the trip, 
The systems used in Germany and France provide the most opportunities for informing passengers. On the other hand, informing passengers in Croatia is limited only to the necessary information such as the display of time and date and departure time by visual or audio means. It should be noted that this information is not available to passengers in all stations and that LED screens are in a limited number of large stations. Comparing the possibilities of informing passengers via websites among the considered infrastructure managers, it is evident that Deutsche Bahn provides the broadest range, uh, range, range of services to passengers. In Croatia, the possibility of booking a seat Cancelling or exchanging tickets and registration when buying tickets is not available and is directly related to the passenger carrier. These shortcomings are not justified, given that there is still only one passenger transport operator in Croatia. In other countries, there are many more due to the liberalization of the passenger transport market. According to the parameters such as uh, possibility to book a ticket, travel planner, um, availability in multiple languages uh, or similar, it can be concluded that the mobile application for passenger information uh, Deutsche Bahn Navigator satisfies the broadest range of parameters considered. Based on the analysis of possible ways of informing passengers in rail transport, the countries with the largest number of passengers per year in the <coughs> European Union provide similar services and solutions for passenger information. For Croatia, which has a significantly smaller number of passengers than the analyzed countries, it is necessary to modernize the way of informing passengers at stations and stops if the railway network's competitiveness is to be increased. Uh, given that passengers today need to obtain specific information related to travel and the possibility of choosing such information, it is necessary to equip stations and stops with solutions that have touchscreens to achieve interactivity with passengers. The most significant current disadvantage is visible in providing information to people with visual and hearing impairments, as the screens at the stations are not adapted to these groups of users. The mentioned shortcoming is also visible when informing passengers before the trip. The information that the railway undertaking must provide to users with visual or hearing impairments must comply with the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.1. The improvement of the passenger information system in Croatia should imply its harmonizations uh, with the integrated passenger transport systems, the introduction of which in the Croatia's territory is yet to follow. Better informing users according to personalized criteria or travel needs is achievable by establishing a multimodal national access point. This point relies on a digital interface that provides relevant data and metadata from all transport service providers. Combining existing public and private access points into one point would further increase the availability of accurate and real-time information to passengers and increase the level of customer satisfaction with the requested service. Passenger information systems in 
Germany, United Kingdom and France do not differ too much in the offer of services. The most significant emphasis is placed on the publicly available set of open data of data providers, which would increase the availability of necessary, accurate, real-time information provided to end users. Uh, this paper is the basis for further research in passenger information systems on the railway network in Croatia and its integration with other subsystems of railway network, uh, railway management, such as ticket management adaptive for individual user groups. It also opened the possibility of comparing data with other passenger information systems in the neighboring countries of Eastern and Central Europe. Thank you so much for your attention. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact or me or my other co-authors. I hope to see you all together soon and please stay safe and take care of each other. Thank you.
Good day to all, my name is Petra Zoric and today I will present you a paper entitled Use Case Information Security Risk Assessment for Providers of Services in a Virtual Environment. I wrote this paper with my co-authors Mario Musa, Tibor Mio Kuljanic and Nikolina Gapelica. First of all, I will say something brief about myself. I'm currently employed as an assistant at the University of Zagreb Faculty of Transport and Traffic Sciences at the Department of Information and Communication Traffic. I'm also a PhD student and I'm developing my knowledge in the laboratory of security and forensic analysis of information communication systems, which is part of the mentioned department. My scientific work is focused on researching the possibility of applying information and communication services in different segments of the transport system. I also had a role in organizing this year's Management of Manufacturing Systems Conference as a local chair. This review of the research consists of the following units. Introduction, Information Security Concept, Management of Information Security Risks, Information Security Risk Assessment by using PRA methodology, ETA and FTA methodology used example on air conditioning system failure and for the last conclusion. In the world of high technology, organizations have become extremely dependent on information systems while various forms of information and data kept on numerous media have become the most valuable resource of business systems. Information security must be taken care of because the value of companies is mostly concentrated in the value of information. Many organizations identify their information as very important assets they need to, prote to protect by internal security checks. In order to fully understand and be able to protect their information, organizations must be acquainted with the concept of information security. It is one of the key parameters which influence organizational exposure business risk. A scenario development to predict and prepare for causal accidents and extraordinary events in nuclear, chemical and energy sector has been used for risk prioritizing and quantification and undertaking of actions. Probabilistic risk assessments or PRA is one of the methodologies based on scenario development elaborated for the needs of high risk and complex systems in nuclear power plants. This methodology allows for quantification of the probability of events related to various types of accidents and quantifies the occurrence of various incidents. This paper presented a use case of information security risk assessment by means of fall tree and event tree methods as part of PRA methodology. The operational concept is based on the availability of service providers' data essential for service delivery in the virtual environment of game of chance. Information security is a state of data confid confidentiality, integrity and availability achieved through the application of the prescribed measures and standards and organizational support to the planning, implementation, checking and improvement of the measures and activities aimed at maintenance of data security. Information security is mainly focused on the so-called CIA triad, confidentiality, integrity and availability of data. Threats as potential cause of unpredicted and unwanted security incidents can cause various business damage or even interrupt business operations. The assets are subject to numerous threats. The mitigation of security threats to information assets has become an important area of organizational strategy. 
information security strategies apply principles and practices based on prevention and reaction. Great efforts are currently being made to protect information security to the maximum. One of the ways of protection is the methods of information security risk assessment in organizations. A risk management system aims at setting up of a permanent mechanism for the control and management of an acceptable level of organizational risks. Risk assessment of information security management systems is often based on the list of information assessed with the data necessary for risk analysis. After defining the assets that are within the scope of the risk assessment, it is necessary to select an appropriate risk assessment methodology. One of the simple methodologies considers a risk through the function of threat probability, PTA, level of information asset vulnerability, LV, and asset value, VA. Risk value is obtained by combining of these variables. After the risk assessment has been performed, information assets owners can choose one of the possible risk management options. First, risk mitigation by application of the appropriate checks. Second, risk acceptance. Third, risk transferred to third parties. Or four, risk avoidance by identifying and suspending the activities which would cause the risk. PRA methodology represents a systematic and comprehensive modality of assessments of the risks relating to complex technical systems. Although these methods were initially used for analyzing the risk to which nuclear stations are exposed, they found their use in other technical systems as well. According to PRA, Risk is defined as a possible adverse effect of a specific activity. It is characterized by two components, scope, strength, or impact of a possible adverse effect, and probability of occurrence of any effect. Most often, PRA can provide answers to the following questions. Which events can lead to adverse consequences? What is, in terms of quality and quantity, potential damage or negative consequences of an initiating event. What is the probability of the frequency of undesired consequences? Traditional PRA methodology uses event tree to list possible scenarios, while fault trees are used for finding the causes of occurrence of certain scenarios. The analysis that uses an event tree is a method of identification and assessment of sequences of events in a potential scenario, accident scenario, which is realized after the occurrence of the initiating event. ETA uses a visual tree structure to present the logic and event development. Various outcomes represent various branches of event tree. ETA aims at determination of the probability of all consequences caused by the initiating event. By analyzing the possible consequences, it is possible to determine the percentage of consequences which lead to a wanted or unwanted result. In cases when risk exposure is too high, one proceeds to the development of the strategies that can change risk exposure. Fault tree analysis is a technique that allows for a systematic description of the combinations of possible underlying events in the system which result in an undesired peak event. The analysis consists of the determination of the un undesirable consequence and their underlying events that contribute to the predictable undesirable peak event. The analysis is based on Boolean logic. Unlike logic diagrams in ETA, where binary values are applied, the probability of the consequences of events in FTA depend on the probability of the underlying events that, le that lead to the analyzed consequences. As a use case 
of the two risk assessment methods, we have considered the case of failure of the air conditioning system of a system room in which important information system computer and network devices of Hrvatska Lutria are located. Hrvatska Lutria is equipped with systems that require high availability and temperature raise in the system room can cause hardware components to stop working. Temperature rise in the event of failure of the air conditioning system in the system room takes place quickly because of the large amount of computer and network resources that hit the space. The, tra the traditional risk analysis method does not provide the possibility to combine all elements to detect all failures which lead to the interruption of functioning. For that reason, ETA method will allow the identification of the series of events which might lead to the failure of air conditioning system and to assess the probability of these events based on the statistic of previous events. By FTA method, each individual event from the event tree will be analyzed. The result is displayed of the list of causes of interruption of air conditioning and display of the probability of that individual subsystem fault to influence the functioning of the whole system. In this use case, methodology of event three use is demonstrated through the following four steps. Initiating event identification, identification of security checks established in response to the possible occurrence of the initiating event, event tree construction and evaluation and description, and interpretation of the obtained incident sequences. The event tree for the described system is presented on this slide. The probability of single marks of the events can vary depending on the presumptions. According to the data collected, the expected accuracy of alarm activation by temperature sensor is 99.9%. After calculation, the final results of F1, F2 and F3 outcomes is the same, but the probability of their occurrence is different. The probability of the positive outcome is more than 85%. In about 4.5% of the cases, system room temperature monitoring sensor will not register temperature increase above the permitted limit. In almost 10% of the cases, when the sensor registers temperature increase and the alarm is activated, this will not be noticed by operators who will not react. In only 1% of the cases, it was not possible to activate the redundant unit. Fault tree analysis methodology was dealing with the three key events identified relating to the control mechanisms of the air conditioning system management and it will be presented in the next few slides. Temperature sensor in the system room has the task to, of monitoring the temperature and activating the alarm if the temperature read exceeds the defined permitted limits. Temperature increase is the most common situation registered by the sensor. The reason for which the sensor does not perform its task may be either sensor defect or interruption of the link between the sensor and alarm system. It is the task of members of responsible technical staff of the examined examined system to monitor the alarm system and turn on the redundant unit if necessary. It is possible that the responsible staff does not notice the alarm. The reason can be either an alarm system defect or failure to monitor the alarm. In case of primary air conditioning unit failure, a member of responsible technical staff must turn the redundant unit on once that the alarm has been registered. However, there might be cases when it is not possible to turn the redundant unit on. The above diagram shows that among possible reasons there are defect of redundant unit 
The effect of the switch used for turning on the redundant unit in the primary system or failure to train the appointment responsible technical staff in charge of air conditioning system supervision. This paper has presented the application of two PRA methodology approaches on a selected subsystem that can be found in almost every modern information center. An initiating event, the implemented system protection checks, possible events related to the implemented checks and probabilities of their occurrence have been identified. Through an analysis of the created trees, it has been concluded which sequences of events are possible, as well as their certainty and their possible causes. By using this approach, probable scenarios with an undesirable impact on information system functionality have been identified and additional data were provided for optimal selection of protection measures. Given the complexity of the implementation of these methods, the most effective application of a methodology is in the second or third risk assessment iteration. It is used for a deeper consideration of potentially high risk detected in the initial iteration. The results of this research give room to further research in the field of data availability in a virtual environment to increase the level of information security. Feel free to contact us if you have some questions about this paper or this topic. Thank you so much for your attention.
Good day to all participants. My name is Vitaly Kovs and I am a PhD student of the Department of Manufacturing, Engineering, Machine and Tools of Summa State University. I am representing the research focused on the technological assurance of bracket type parts manufacturing. This research was conducted in co-authorship with Professor Vitaly Ivanov, Professor Alexander Leposhenko and Professor Ivan Pavlenko. I would like to start my presentation from a brief overview of my university. The key directions of Sumi State University are research, education and internationalization. We have more than 200 partners from 96 countries. Together we realize the research and education project with universities from 45 countries, as well as establish an academic mobility program with 39 countries. Sumi State University is represented in several rankings from, for example, QS, Times, Webometrics, our latest achievement is uh, the position 501, 600 and the first and the second position among Ukrainian universities in the ranking of the world universities rankings by time higher education. We are open to collaboration in academic mobility, capacity building and innovation, innovation education, professional training and joint research results. Let, ta uh, let me start with the major challenges in modern manufacturing. Manufacturing engineering is uh, responsible for 70% of the entire global trade. Today the main challenge is the contradiction, contradiction between the need to reduce the time required to design manufacturing the products and the increasing complexity of product design. Over the past 25 years the product range has increased more than two times. Constant, the increase in complexity and demand for accuracy and product quality are increasing. The equipment uh, and process should be more flexible to mind the needs of the market uh, to reduce the amount of time to market. The essential point in manufacturing is analyzing the technological, technological system, uh, machine tool, fixture, workpiece, cutting tool. As a closed loop system where every component affects other components and the system. Traditionally, fixture system divided into dedicated and flexible. Dedicated fixtures are designed for mass production. The design, fabrication and testing of fixture require significant time and cost in the product development cycle. Flexible fixtures were developed to reduce the above Nation parameters the use of flexible fixture and has a fixture flexibility with which is especially a benefit to small volume of production and the new product prototyping. According to annual reports from different countries, the most in demand is drilling, milling, boring equipment. Analysis of the structure of this equipment allows us to make the statement machine centers as the first priority equipment for modern manufacturing. The experience of the Japanese machine tool industry showed that 60% of new machines are drilling, milling, boring machine tools and 95% of them are machining centers. 91% of new machines are CNC machine tools. The key points of uh, motivation to buy machining centers are increasing productivity, updating technology and increasing capacity. Analysis of uh, more uh, than 1000 uh, uh, machine tools from, the, uh, uh, from more than uh, 30 manufacturers allow identified the most in demand parameters of machining, machine tools. Uh, there is a tendency for uh, investment in horizontal machine centers. The bracket in the automotive industry is one of the most common parts. Traditionally, they use for connecting different equipment uh, for priority and secondary purposes. Bracket type parts are characterized by the possibility of using unified cutting tools, uh, tool availability of surface during machining and control operation, possibility of surface machining with the maximum productivity, simplicity of uh, location charts and reliability of clamping of uh, preparation in the machine tool device. 
Uh, based on their problem-oriented analysis of bracket type paths, design and uh, technological classification is proposed uh, which took uh, into account all possibility designs of brackets that uh, may occur in the automob automotive industry. There are 11 classification attributes uh, the, that were identified. The bracket present at the slide is a component of any vehicle in for instance, for car, uh, car truck, uh, tractor and bus. The configuration of the part can be uh, different in size and shape slightly. Most brackets are made of steel and cast iron. Metal brackets are most uh, highest range products. They are made of uh, materials resistant to various machine uh, mechanical loads, temperature and uh, a chemical influence. Based on the capability of modern metal cut equipment, it was proposed uh, to en uh, intensify the manufacturing process by combining operations uh, 5045 into one complex on the CNC machining center. Such an approach allows reducing the process by six operations. According to the proposed uh, man manufacturing process, the machining can be realized in six positions. For all analysis manufacturing process for complex part man machining, that same tendency is observed, namely reduction of accelerate time in a proposed manufacturing process in compression with typical ones. Machining surface are holes position K, M, O, P, uh, legs position A, B, G, H, mm, I, and the uh, grooving position G. In order to optimize to optimize the structure of the operation, technological graphs have been development. The quality of products uh, greatly depends uh, on the accurate accuracy of size, the accuracy of uh, special relationships, uh, the accuracy of surface forms, and the rawness of the machine machine surface. The strength for parts manufacturing is based on the development of technological graphs, which determines the relationship between the work surface in different positions. The graphs introduce the order of surface machining in achieving the required quality of parts on CNC multi-axis machining operations. The development of a flexible fixer allowing to implement fundamental new achievements of for the setup of workpiece is a very important task that requires further in-depth research. A flexible fixer is proposed to implement the locating chart for the proposed manufacturing operation. 50. The development of uh, flexible fixer in various positions allows uh, crane out all drilling and milling operation at one setup. The use of a flexible fixer provides a higher level of uh, flexibility and reduces the cost of the uh, preparatory and finally time for readjustment during the transition to the machining of workpiece of other size. The study of the stress strain uh, state of the machining device involves testing for strength, detection of stress uh, concentration and elements where the stress are greater than those allowed uh, for the material. material. From the obtained results it was determined uh, uh, that uh, the maximum equivalent stress uh, that occurred during processing and on the contact surface do not exceed uh, the allowed well values uh, of loads. It was found that the mm, movements in all cases in processing are elastic. This maximum cutting forces does not uh, change the shape of the path. Using uh, the built-in module in NCIS software, make the natural oxidation fre frequencies of uh, mm, of the flexible fixer were determined. Uh, the obtained results of the oxidation uh, frequencies of uh, showed that the stiffness of the proposed uh, flexible fixer uh, fixer is uh, uh, safest for the manufacturing of the parts and uh, mm, reason does not occur. Uh, harmonic analysis were performed using the built-in harmonic analysis uh, module of ANSYS workbench. The amplitudes of the dynamic components of force and cutting movements uh, were uh, choose uh, within 20% uh, uh, of the values. Nominal value theoretical studies allowed uh, 
to establish the value of oscillation amplitudes in the machining zone and confirm the efficiency of the proposed fixture because the values of the amplitudes do not exceed exceed of the manufacturing tolerances. To sum up identified areas of research that have been in instrument study, namely the study of accuracy and uh, rigidity of uh, the fixture as well as contact interaction in the system fixture workpiece, classification of parts like bracket of design and technological parameters is development according to the design and technological classification. A method of uh, Coding parts such as bracket has been development, which allows automating the process of uh, design a fixture. A new design of the flexible fixture has been development. Thank you for your attention.
Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mateusz Kurowski and I would like to present you the article I wrote in cooperation with Katarzyna Huck. We represent the University of Jona Góra. The title of the article is Analysis of the Transport Market during the COVID-19 pandemic based on freight exchange. The road transport is the most popular mode of transport in Europe. It is not only the instrument of supporting goods for the final customers, but also an important branch of economies. European road transport companies vary in terms of size, range, fleet and specialization, but they all must follow new trends to resist the competitive pressure. It is even more important in times of crisis when all the entities must operate under new and familiar yet conditions. The recent situation with COVID-19 pandemic can also be considered as one of these critical situations, especially for companies with international operations. New law regulations concerning border crossings, quarantines, observed slowdown in many sectors and other factors affected road transport companies. It is the challenge for managers to lead the company through the impediments of the pandemic. By the time when the research was performed, the highest incidence rates in Europe were observed in March and April 2020. Statistics on the number of cases in an analyzed period are presented in figure. The chart presents the number of COVID-19 daily confirmed cases for Poland, Slovakia, Germany, Italy and Spain. Italy was the first country in Europe to observe the significant number of patients and the fastest upward trend in confirmed cases. The next countries where the, where the epidemic had the greatest dynamics was Spain and Germany. In Poland and Slovakia, a steady tendency to increase the number of patients can be seen. There have been many various actions taken to limit the spread of the virus. Some of them influenced Polish and Slovak transportation market. The situation on Polish and Slovak transport market. Data for our research was obtained from freight exchanges, TransEU and Timocon. The research was focused on three areas. One, demand for transport services. Two, supply of transport services. Three, freight rates. The period of the study was March and April 2020. Transport offers and freight prices for Poland and Slovakia were analyzed in cycles for Monday to, from Monday to Friday. Three destinations countries were selected for the study, in which they are direct contractors of these countries, and the number of transports in these directions is high according to transport exchanges, and in which large outbreaks of COVID-19 were recorded. These are Italy, Spain and Germany. Road transport was one of the areas of the economy that was affected by the pandemic. In the survey conducted by, by the authors of the article, as much as 88%, it is 100% in transport and forwarding sector, respondents admit that the epidemic had an impact on their activities. 62% indicated that the biggest problem was organizational issues related to the closed borders, 61% indicated a decrease in the number of orders, and 48% had to reduce jobs. In addition, the interviewees indicated an increase in operating costs. It was 30.5% of interviewees and the inability to complete orders for contractors, 28%. 1% of respondents said that they had to terminate an employment contract with driver as a result of the current market situation. First of all, the analysis of demand and supply was made by based on the data of transactions carried out on transport exchanges. The transport was divided into two groups for analysis. FTL, it will be blue on the charts, full truck loads means the transport during which a truck transports one load and thus is fully loaded. And LTL, 
it will be read on the charts less than truck load bulk transport the term for partial load on the truck usually if the truck is not fully loaded further partial loads are consolidated so the transportation is profitable an alternative to transporting partial loads is collective freight Analysis of demand for transport services from Poland to Germany, Italy, Spain and Slovakia. In Poland, the number of offers representing the demand for transport services has fallen in both FTL and LTL, but stronger decline was observed in FTL. The decrease can be seen in mid-March, which is the period of development of the pandemic, and the increased number of reported cases. In May, a slow increase can be noted for these services and the most significant for Poland-Spain route. From the above observations, it can be seen that the market situation is slowly returning to its previous state. This is a direct reflection of increasing production and exports in individual countries. In Slovakia, in the analyzed period, a considerable difference between demand for FTL and LTL transport to Germany Italy and Poland was reduced. A significant drop in demand for transport services can be seen in mid-March this year and it applies especially in FTL. In the case of Germany, the positive trend started to bring the demand to pre-pandemic level, when in three other directions the situation is still sta stable. Analysis of the supply of transport services from Poland to Germany, Italy, Spain and Slovakia. When it comes to freight supply in Poland, a steady supply trade trend for transport services can be observed. A slight decrease occurred in the analyzed period of March this year. However, it is less significant that in the case of demand for transport services, fall to zero represents holidays or non-working days. In Slovakia, we can observe the analogical trend. In the case of supply, we deal with the number of transport service offers on the markets. Theoretically, pandemic should not affect supply, which translates into the number of transport units. It is relatively constant and its decline could be caused by the closure of transport and forwarding companies, the sale of transport units or other activities that would result in a decrease in the number of transport services offered on the markets. The slight decline in transport service offers in March could have been the result of psychological issues and restrictions in traveling to endangered areas. The increase of supply in April and May could be the result of potential rise in prices for transport services as a result of pandemic and the economic situation in the individual countries. However, this was not a direct factor. This drop and rapid increase in transport services supply is a characteristic to Slovakia and Poland to all directions. Analysis of freight demand supply ratio. The situation on transport market can be also described by demand supply ratio, which shows the directions and the scale of markets inequality. Data for this phase of the research was derived from Timocon. Figures represent demand supply ratios calculated for the numbers of offers in the periods from January to May for 2018, 19 and 2020. The indicators for Poland are shown in the table. What can be seen is the fact that in all four directions there was a considerable decrease of demand in, in relation to supply of transport services in March-April 2020. It could be considered as a seasonal fluctuation, but data for previous years shows different. In Slovakia there is also a significant decrease in demand for transport services in relation to supply in March-April 2020 in all analyzed directions. The last of analyzed parameters are prices for transport services calculated on the basis of transactions made on trans-EU exchanges. Freight rates were relatively constant in Poland. 
there was a slight decrease in mid-March and continuous return to pre-pandemic level of freight rates. In Slovakia, it can be noted that after the peak of the pandemic in countries for destination, there were more days without executed transactions. It applies especially for Spain, where the low number of transaction, transactions makes it impossible to draw the trend of the freight rate. While freight rates for transport to Germany and Poland remained relatively constant, freight rates to Italy are lower than in pre-pandemic time. Conclusion. Conducted research showed that COVID-19 pandemic had an impact on transport market. Surveys showed that companies had formal problems with crossing the borders, they suffered from less amount of transport offers and higher operational costs. Some of them were forced to reduce the number of workers. Data derived from freight exchanges illustrate the significant decrease in demand for transport services in Slovakia and Poland to each other Germany, Italy and Spain in mid-March. The decline was more severe for FTL than LTL transactions. In both compared countries, supply of transport services was more constant than demand, but mid-March drop is also noticeable. This observation reflects in demand supply ratio, which shows that the relative decline in transport service demand in March April was not a seasonal fluctuation for Slovakia and Poland. The analysis of freight rates show that there are more days without successful transactions, especially in Slovakia. Higher count of transactions in Poland allow to follow the general trend. It should be noted that after an initial drop of freight rates in mid-March, they started to return into the pre-pandemic level. Thank you for your attention. Do not hesitate to contact us if you have any questions or remarks.
Good afternoon, dear colleagues. My name is Olena Sivakovska. I am an associate professor at Lutsk National Technical University in Ukraine. The theme of our report is Project Safety Management System of Students with 3D Games Development. One of the main directions for development of the modern state is the sphere of ensuring the safety of the population. In recent years, issues of public safety have become an acute problem in our country. At the same time, the search for new approaches to the development of more effective and the, at the same time useful projects to ensure the safety of students in the social direction of marketing and economic policy of the states has been continued to. Today it's possible to imagine our life without gadgets. The virtual world attracts children and adults to its webs. Modern children actively use smartphones, tablets and computers. Of course, one on the one hand perhaps it's bad. Studies have shown that too much gadgets may negatively affect a children's brains on its functioning and may even cause attention deficit, cognitive delays, impaired learning, increased impulsivity and decreased ability to self-regulation. However, on the other hand, despite publication by a reputable press, the use of media devices has only increased over the years and has a number of advantages. The developers offer a lot of interactive and social applications, the main function of which is to simplify our lives or teach children something new, for example, through the various educational games and puzzles. As there are restrictions in the legalization on timing and timing of exercise related to actions in emergencies, our proposed concept involves the use of modern hardware equipped with a special software in the form of a game that can be used during classes and after school hours and a system of students in the incentives too. Therefore, the issue of software development with using the techniques of virtual modeling is relevant, a key aspect of which would be to help improve the safety of students in case of emergencies in educational institution. The object of the study is the project of a safety measurement system for students with the development of 3D simulator as a digital game for training desirable behavior in the event of emergency of different nature and under direction different conditions. The aim of research is to develop a project of safety management system for students with 3D game development pupil safety training simulator. The developed software will help to increase the level of socioeconomic protection of students through the game in a 3D simulator which will be offered to students as homework or before lessons or as training behavior in emergencies of different nature and under different conditions. The implementation of the proposed project will reduce the number of injuries and deaths of students that occur for organizational reasons from 25 to 40%. Problems of fire safety in Ukraine are becoming increasingly important. Existing methods of risk analysis and the causes of their con occurrence during the educational process in educational institutions are based on the fact that the occurrence of injury risk is caused by two main concepts. Insufficiently developed system of organizational support, that is, briefings, training, real examples, insufficient material and techni technical provision of educational facilities with the necessary resources, insufficient material and uh, technical provision of educational facilities with the necessary resources, for example, fire alarms, alarm system and other devices and technical means that must ensure the safety of participant in the learning process. Figure 1 shows it. The raising the level of safety and reducing injury risk to participants in the educational process is possible by improving the quality of organization and technical components. The possible solution to this problem is to improve curricula and 
briefings depending on the type of classes in the form of reminders of the dangers during classes. The more difficult task is to minimize the risk of injury during an emergency. The basic causes of risk are the physiological and emotional state of the student. Its influence under certain conditional conditions can lead to failure to ensure their own safety, as well as the failure of technical and, and organizational support, weather conditions which will lead to catastrophic consequences. Such functioning primarily includes the ability to properly and quickly evacuate from the skin scene of danger with the team in emergencies of various kinds, and this in turn depends on the degree of preparedness of students. We can say that the process of risk injury formation consists of three components. Figure 2 illustrates this process. Analyzing the following co components of the security system, we conclude that its operation is directly related to the level of preparation of students for action in emergency. Trainings in real condition must be carried out for its preparation. However, such training usually doesn't give the described desirable effectiveness. Students are simply not interested in listening to dry theory. There is no real, real threat or encouragement that would motivate to action and, of course, there is no lack of comprehensible practice in emergency situation which would cause the development of, the re of resilience and shock reduction in the event of real threat. The great importance in educational institution is the regular particular training of evacuation. One can only imagine the shock if this situation occurs. So, the lack of behavioral skills of staffs and students will lead to panic and an accessory for fuss. As a result, carbon monoxide poisoning or chemical fires or the possibility of causalities. It has been scientifically proven that the time of evacuation depends on the number of trainings, the width of the passage and the number of people. Evacuation will be faster when we give it more training. We determine the dependence of testing time on the number of virtual workouts. Our researchers are illustrated on Table 1. During testing, students have become acquainted with photos of rooms and evacuation routes on a real object. It was, it was used a virtual environment of that space. The task of the test is to learn the evacuate quickly from a real object through the use of the student's visual memory. They made mistakes. After all, mistakes driven training provides students with a risk free setting to explore different actions and experience their consequences. All wrong actions and mistakes were taken into account, so each next time a student improved his results better. This type of test game will introduce certainly to the subconsequence automatism of correct behavior and at the same time will familiarize participants with the multi-dimensional threat situation. Students and teachers will be able to better orient themselves in the university rooms and improve their skills during such emergencies. The truth of this is reflected in the graph. The graph shows a direct relationship between the number of training sessions and evacuation time. Accordingly, the greater the number of training sessions, the shorter the evacuation time, but it must be borne in mind that the dependence operates to a certain extent. Practical studies show that the minimum time that can be achieved with increased training can be 3 4 minutes. It is impossible to further reduce the time due to the 
capacity of the corridors, their length, a number of people and other factors that may affect this process. For example, in the cold season you need more time to put on clothes. Changes in meteorological condition must be taken into account too. For example, condensate on the floor reduces the span, the speed of movement in buildings. The above analysis shows that the safety of students directly depends on the level of their emotional and physiological state during the emergency, which in turn affects uh, the speed of assessment of the situation, making the right decision and the order of the actions of the student and also has a direct dependence on the number of training with students. As there are restrictions in the legalization of the deadlines and timing exercise related to actions in emergencies, we, we propose a concept that involves the use of modern technical means. They are equipped with a special software in the form of a game that can be used during classes and after school hours. Our proposed conception includes students incentive system that provides an addition of points in the relevant classes in safety disciplines and educational institutions. The game environment should virtually simulate possible emergencies with the display of all rooms in the buildings of the real object and allow the participant to assess the situation, make decisions, moving around the object. The ultimate goal of the game is to bring to the automatism of the participants' actions regarding the safety in the event of an emergency at a particular object. The game consists of several stages. After passing each stage, the software evaluates the correctness of the participants' action, points out errors and makes an assessment that can be credited during the learning process. The current training standards and the training plan do not allow to increase the number of trainings due to time constraints. It is necessary to look for a way for ways to reduce the evacuate time. To solve this problem, we have proposed a method of virtual training using computer technology at homework or before lessons. The essence of the uh, of this technique is that first in real condition is training on evacuated evacuation from a real object. Further students are offered a virtual computer game test as homework. It based on the knowledge and skills gained in a process of real training with the using our proposed 3D simulator. The virtual environment of the 3D simulator will display the premises of a real object with the, help, with the help of a panoramic photo taken in advance with details of all the rooms. The task of the game test is to learn to evacuate quickly from a real object through the use of the student's visual memory. It includes the ability to take into account all the actions and mistakes made during training to pass the entire evacuation test from the objects in the passing game again. In this case, the game test will contain three modes for students, for employees and joint actions of both categories. The reasons for this division is different responsibility during the evacuation. A 3D plan of, of the institution will be included in the game test. It's based on a pr previous photo or video or the object of the object and has a holistic structure is in real life. For the quickly search, a first aid kit, fire exit extinguisher or sandbox in, a, in the game, they will stand out. It should be also added the most common mistakes that people do during emergency and the explanation of why they should not do such mistakes. The game will include the maximum possible number of situations. It will focus on the different ages of participants in the educational process and the nature of emergencies, for example, man-made emergencies, emergencies caused by natural disaster.
players will be able to choose their action and direction of movement with they, which uh, they will check the correctness of their actions and will be able to improve them. In addition to the game part, this program will include tests, how to provide first aid, what numbers to call the appropriate service, when to use the fire extinguisher and so on. It is in addition, it is necessary to use a SWOT analysis to ensure the um, achievement on the project objectives and contribute to its efficiency. It shows table two. For successful implementation and start of the project product, there is a need for a details analysis calculation of all necessary work. It must be created work breakdown structure as illustrated in figure two. The Wii model methodology was used to develop the software product 3D Simulator, which is used to create software products with, with con continuous operation. It's shown in Figure 5. Project cost management in, uh, integrates the process performed during planning, budgeting and cost management and ensures the uh, compl complexion of the project with the approved budget. The project is limited not only by time, but also by material and labor resources. All the necessary resources were allocated to implement the project with the help of Microsoft Project. Essentials is the socio-economic effectiveness of the project to cre create measure for the student safety. We recall the human security is recognized by our state as the highest value. So pupils and students represent the future of our state, which depends entirely on the quali quality and safety of learning and living condition. There is no clear assessment of the cost of uh, living and health of citizens of Ukraine in monetary terms. However, it can be in, uh, calculated using the methods of assessing losses from the consequences of man-made and natural emer emergencies. The total amount of loss of public life and health is calculated by Formula 1. It is calculated the cost of human life and total losses from the consequences of emergency for one Ukrainian in 2019 in Table 3. The social effectiveness of the project, first of all, is the ability to posi uh, positively influence the protection of the greatest value, human life and health, and especially the participants in the educational process. The economic efficiency of the project is to significantly reduce the financial cost of investors, which can also be the state. So the cost of the investor is much less than the cost of monetary compensation to people who were injured or to the relatives of those killed in the emergency. We have proposed a method of virtual training that uses um, computer technology in the form of various games that will be offered to students as homework or before lessons or as a training behavior in the event of the emergency of a different nature and under different conditions. The economic efficiency of the object is to significantly reduce the financial cost of investors and the state too. The cost of the project they create safety measure for the student is much less than the most of monetary compensation for people in the uh, event of injury or people are reflect, affected by the consequences of emergency and families are just killed in the emergency. The implementation of the proposed uh, projects will reduce the number of injuries that deaths of students that occur of organizational reasons from 25 to 40 percent. Thank you for your attention.
The ladies and gentlemen, I wish you a pleasant day. I'd like to introduce our paper on intangibles in manufacturing industry and empirical analysis written by me as presenter, Joseph Glova is my name, uh, and two co-authors, Alena Andreowska and Olga Vekshova from Technical University in Košice, uh, from the Slovak Republic. In our paper, we analyzed the effect of firms' intangibles in manufacturing industry expressed as research and development expenses and investment in intangible assets on firm value. As you can see in presentation, our presentation is divided in the following parts. We start from the introduction part, uh, going through theoretical background, then discussing motivation of research, data and methodology used, and coming to the final empirical analysis and results, which are summarized in conclusion part. Uh, from the beginning of human beings, creativity, intelligence, and adaptability of us as human was exactly the thing that distinguished us from the rest of nature. Uh, the ability of learning and extending the perception of reality led to simplification of work and increase of productivity with much higher efficiency. Um, as we can see in the past, we actually had four industrial revolution, beginning with the first industrial revolution with help uh, transfer hand production to simple machine in 18th century, and which actually helped a lot to many primary sectors in economy. The second revolution helped humans to be faster and much more interconnected. Railroad networks and telegraphs had been built and that helped a lot to transfer people and ideas. The next significant progress came in form of information and telecommunication technologies which significantly contributed even to the era what we call automation or industry for that come from the high-tech strategy project of the German government that promotes automation in manufacturing. Uh, in uh, today's economics, uh, everything very strongly depends on the creation, distribution, and use of knowledge. And knowledge is very interconnected with what we call intangible or intangible assets. In our global economy, we can observe that the increase in the amount of corporate intangible assets influence the firm behavior. Uh, even uh, intangible assets lack of physical substance and don't have a financial embodiment, what we can see that intangibles are uh, embodied are involved in many aspects of, of company lives. Uh, valuation of this kind of assets is very difficult and uncertain. And their location within the company is difficult as well uh, there are difficult uh, perspective how to how to have to measure and how to actually uh, specify this this very very uh, difficult part of of uh, intangibles. Uh, however, economists 
first uh, recognize the growing contribution of intangibles in GDP growth, what we can see, for instance, in Corrado et al. Uh, the fact that the topic of intangibles and intellectual capital is very popular and important is highlighted by evidence. So what you can actually see in, in uh, different uh, uh, and numerous studies and different uh, expert groups set up by the European Commission as well as other governments uh, around the globe. Uh, we have listed the most important uh, studies uh, from the perspective of the European Commission and European Union for the European firms. So you can see the study on the measurement of intangible assets provided by, by universities from uh, Italy, from Australia, and US and other reports uh, which are really uh, important for uh, theoretical perspective. Mm, even we have we have these studies, the definition and classification is still very open issue. Uh, but from the perspective, practical perspective, firms tend to group intangible assets into three main cat categories, human capital, structure capital, and relational capital. From another point of view, firms also distinguish between intangible resources and intangible activities. There is also perspective of accrual system and for example Montresso et al. describes intangible assets in broad sense as everything what is non-physical and thus not touchable and focus on their identification, identification via survey. On the other hand, According to Ashton, intangible activities comprise all dynamic investments to purchase or generate intangible assets. Uh, intangible assets in form of patents, copyrights, licenses or trademarks can be acquired separately or in business combination by purchase or by internal generation through research and development efforts, marketing research, or investments in organizational capital. In our paper, we focus on two specific financial state statements items on intangible fixed assets from the balance sheet and on research and development expenses from the profit and loss account. And following slides, we will discuss our motivation data, or better to say data sample, and methodology or methods, even methods applied in our research. Uh, we initially collected 1092 observation for the time period 2011 to 2015. That was the initial idea to analyze the data to find out if there is a relationship between research and development expenses and intangible assets itself in regard to firm value. Due to missing values for research and development expenses uh, and intangible fixed assets, we actually f finally decided to use 143 European public uh, listed companies 
for five years perspective. What we can see in reality is the fact that the share of the European Union firms reporting research and development expenses on their balance sheet as intangible asset is the highest in comparison with those of the US and Japan. In the table below, we can see number of observation and some structure uh, according to countries. We see that there are much, uh, much often observation from Germany, France, Great Britain in the data set. Our data sample cover uh, only manufacturing industry where sufficient intangible fixed assets and research and development expenses reporting data were available. Uh, in the table, you can see descriptive statistics for the manufacturing sector. This is the sector C according to NACE. Uh, we see the number of observation, mean values, median values, and standard deviation of the values for research and development expenses, as well as for uh, intangible assets itself. Uh, not very uh, surprisingly was that there is a high linear dependency between variables involved in the research. You see uh, in a correlation matrix, very high uh, linear correlation uh, in, in the specific variables that actually uh, can, can uh, be some mark of importance of intangible assets as well as uh, research and development expenses on firm value. In our analysis, we use the following steps. At the beginning, we prepared structure and analyze typical panel data model with many individual observation across several time periods. Uh, then we apply test for pullability. There was the idea if we have simple, ordinary less square model, or if we have models with fixed or random effects, and show test help us a lot to go to the next step where we decided to apply Hausmann test for estimating fixed or random effects model. Then we tested serial correlation and cross-sectional de dependence. Based on it, we applied heteroscedasticity, a robust variance covariance matrix to estimate unbiased regression coefficients. And finally, in uh, our analysis, we applied and let run a panel model with time fixed effect, with we described and use in the in the following parts. Uh, we let run a panel model with time fix effect indicate that research and development con expenses contribute more to the market capitalization value of company in comparison with intangible assets. You can see it in the table below and actually even from the description that one euro increase in intangible will show up in almost 2.7 euro increase in market capitalization. But you see much more four time stronger reaction in, in uh, uh, research and development expenses. Uh, what we observe a significant linear relationship between research and development expenses and market value. The plot below clearly 
reveals the tendency of the dispersion of market value, which increases along with increasing investment into research and de development. However, uh, in much higher quantiles, uh, there, there is uh, evidence that may indicate that research and development expenses are not the only factors which contributes to market value creation effect. Uh, in our paper, we focus on quantitative analysis of the relationship between two explanatory variables and one dependent variable. We apply capitalized intangible fixed assets and expands research and development expenses for the time period 2011-2015 for uh, observation of 143 firms. Based on empirical evidence, we found out significant prominence of intangible fixed assets and research and development expenses for market capitalization uh, value of the firms in manufacturing industry. Uh, what we can see from the results uh, uh, the analysis within the firms from manufacturing industry indicate the more accelerated increase of market capitalization value with the increase of research and development expenses compared to intangible fixed assets. And based on the results of quantile regression, we can suppose that the investment into research and development are the most essential for the manufacturing firms with a middle value of market capitalization. On the other hand, however, the effect of intangible fixed assets was demonstrably high for quantiles of firms with a high market capitalization value. What actually may indicate capitalizing intangible asset is costly and may be the result of previous successful research and development activities. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and please don't hesitate and feel free to contact us. My email address is listed and I wish you a really nice day. Bye.
Hello everyone, my name is Luis Silva. On behalf of my colleagues, I come to present this work, named the Systematic Analysis of an Industrial Pickup and Placement Production System. This work was carried out in conjunction with the Mechanics and Sciences Department of University of Minho and Boscar Multimedia Portugal. In summary, this work based on analysis of levels of rejection and quality of the components in a SMT line after a nozzle change. The outline. As we can see, we'll talk about the company Bosch Car Multimedia, the problem introduction, SMT process, nozzle changes, NAT analysis, and lastly, conclusions and future works. The company, the Bosch, Bosch Car Multimedia Portugal, in place, is based in Braga and is dedicated to development and production of a communication system and entertainment instrumentation uh, for vehicles like sensors and safety sensors. Um, the problem introduction. The main problem here, or the main problems here are rejection and quality, and the bad quality. Okay? The rejection is caused by um, zero, 0402 component rejected and the quality is caused by defects uh, of 0402 components. The cause of these, these problems are, are a bad nozzle selection and the impact of this causes thousand heroes lost. So the main focus of this work was to try limit these losses uh, of money to the company as much as possible. SMT process. The surface mount technology SMT is a producing method from electronic circuits uh, which use uh, SMT components mounted on the on the board on the on the sur on your surface like we can see the in, in the in the corner in the left corner, the SMD components that are placed uh, placed to, to in the board in the in the right corner. Okay, it's allowing to to use in the both sides of, of the product these components. Okay, the SMT com setup is a, is a generic, um, but first one transport system in the pink. Uh, is responsible to transport ports from the machine to machine are essentially loaders okay and two solder pass disposition it is a local where the solder pass is placed in the pads of the boards and can be essentially by a stencil or solitaire disposition in three inspection system inspection system can be before the the, before the the automatic placement machine or, or after that before its focus on solder pass is solder pass inspection system it is responsible to check if the solder pass is correctly placed on the pads of the boards and after that uh, AOI high automated optical inspection before the after the um, the automatic placement machine are responsible to check if the components are correctly placed on the right place uh, of the board. The orange uh, are the automatic placement machines responsible to put the components on the boards and the five the past welding system is like a hoven that allows solder pass to make a correct connection with the components. The next one when we talk about the rejection, we need to talk about the machines and nozzles and components. So, on the left, you can see a pick and place machine, the example of this work. In this work, and uh, in the next one, you can see the nozzles 907 and 925, nozzles used in this work, responsible to pick up the components. 0402 and down 
can see the components T of what zero two in the tape. These components measure one millimeter four point two zero point five millimeters. These components are supplied in the tape uh, to the machine, like we can see the rolls previous in the previous image. Okay, and in the right you can see the main problem here uh, that allow vacuum losses. Okay. This problem was studied more detailed in, uh, in the other paper submitted, but um, the cause here is is the incorrect nozzle selection and irregularities in, on components from different suppliers. In in this in the study uh, of this presentation um, is more superficial. Okay is more focused on data analysis of these results. The quality defects. Quality defects uh, uh, can be originated in any stage of SMT process. You can see there uh, four examples of components defects uh, detected in HAOI system. But um, the um, exists a strong correlation with um, the pick and place machines and, uh, uh, and the defects so this one this is a, one part of this work that you want to prove okay the nozzle changes by previous work we conclude that the ideal solution is select 907 resistors uh, nine zero, nozzle 907 for resistors and 925 for capacitor 0402 but for some reason the company didn't allow uh, allow with that for I think it was a uh, bureaucratic reasons but uh, only permit the use of the solution uh, right there nozzle to put nozzle 925 for two capacitors okay and nozzle 907 all the for all the the other the other components except the other two so what's happening here the optimizer of the machine tends to make all movements in order to optimize the co the collection time so it's normal that very rarely exceed nozzle extension nozzle 925 for 907 to put uh, the resistors and the rest of capacitors because the machine will not wasting time making an exchange when we have the nozzle that serves to put all the components so the expect the expected results is will be good for capacitors and bad for resistors because they don't have the ideal nozzle. So we organize this data and uh, complies in the, um, the plots and do some hypothesis tests, name of the man Whitney Wilcoxon hypothesis test with 5% significance in level. And we, we made a, a plot for rejection in the capacitors and one for rejection in the resistors in different lines and in different months month A before the improvement and month B after the improvement in the capacitors we see a good results uh, in terms of rejection always above the target uh, the rejection for resistors uh, is not the same way Okay, uh, is is bad for resistors because nozzle was not the ideal one. And in terms of tests, hypothesis tests, uh, line one, line twenty one, did not result in significant changes. But in the line twenty five and in the both lines together, confirm confirm the suspect improvement of of the process. So is is good. For line 21, for resistors, did not result in significant changes, significant significant changes too. But in line 25, 
in, in the bolt lines nozzle chains negatively affect the placement of the resistor so we need to analyze the results of the quality too so in terms of quality uh, the results are different they are good in the both cases they decrease um, decrease in the both cases the the defects for capacitors and for resistors in the in the two months so it was good this analysis was made in ppn because the amounts in comparated uh, amounts comparated are, are different okay so we have a question now which one has more weight the rejection or the quality the answer is here okay firstly we need to understand what each one means okay but first we need to understand what is the main cost the main cost is the components rejected plus board with the defects the components rejected are the 0402 lost uh, in the machine in the automatic pick and place machine okay and the quality defects in this case refers a board scrap because the boards and this product here in study is repair free so it yeah, means the the components poorly placed uh, on the board can't be repairable this implies that all the components uh, included all the all, all placed in the right way go to trash so is more money lost when we talk about quality next we we compose the, this this plot with uh, we use this data to to do this plot and construct the uh, grow use it by equation uh, grow rate okay when the present value means the main cost after changes and the past value means the main cost before the changes and we can see for capacitors and for resistors an increase of savings in the boat lines next one we need to see the impact of preventive maintenance on 0402 capacitor rejection uh, construct this plot uh, in the with the consumption and uh, the rejection and a timeline for one month and I can see the the rejection curve in, at the green okay and um, you can see another change presenting in the red one and uh, the purple one because have other other maintenance and other maintenance too okay and the target value here you can see the green curve uh, generic the rejection the rejection curve generic below's above the target okay except one have them the nozzle change nozzle change uh, was made weekly and uh, it we do it well because uh, when uh, when it looks for example for six day the rejection curve rise up and after that uh, decrease so the the maintenance was good influenced the rejection so the nozzle change must be made weekly in the conclusions the nozzle change was positive in terms of placement costs productivity and quality um, the monthly general analysis proven proved a significant improvement in the placement of the capacitors like uh, like what well, like we saw the, there there was a decrease in the number of effects for both cases capacitors and resistors uh, by relating the rejection costs to the quality costs results in the positive growth rate around 
to 35 for capacitors in line 21 and 25 and cap and the uh, 7 for uh, to to 33 in the um, in the line 21 and 25 for resistors another change must be carried out weekly so as not to compromise the production in the future works we need to study the viability of the implement 907 nozzles for placement 0402 resistors and check the production cycle time and the study other problematic components and your nozzles if required new nozzles may be developed thank you for watching
Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to present paper with title Analysis of the possibilities of increasing the efficiency of a manufacturing company through the application of an in innovative marketing strategy. Authors of the papers are Anna Maria Behunova, Marcel Behun and uh, Tomacek. Marketing is a very current topic. This topic is often discussed not only in media, but also in companies and by ordinary people, customers and final consumers. A lot of people see marketing as a tool which helps us to sell the product or service. It is partly true. In modern marketing, the customer opinion is very important and it's necessary on, to focus on what precedes and precede uh, the sale, where these days the relationships between a customer and the company is starting to grow. The main task of this article is to focus on the modern marketing directions, which companies can manufacture and efficiently sell the product or service with. Also, it's necessary to focus on the most modern marketing directions, which are based on consumer demands. It's very important to satisfy consumers' needs and this is why it's necessary to analyze and evaluate their requirements and improve them in the production processes. Many of new modern marketing directions which raise effectively, effectivity in production and competitiveness on the market has been created because of these circumstances. Companies in the recent years started to realize how important part of the production processes is customer, so they started connecting their potential customer in non-typical forms. By analyzing each modern marketing strategy, we reached the conclusion that even small companies can, ha can have quality marketing without investing a big amount of money. The same we can apply in the opposite. It does not mean uh, that if you spend a lot of money in marketing, it will be successful. Most of modern marketing strategies were focused on customer uh, needs. By using these types of strategies in a practice, we can see specific uh, cases that uh, were really effective and successful. In this fast moving world, a lot of companies forget the power of marketing. Even some smaller companies claim that they do not uh, need marketing. We want to draw attention that every company, even a small company should not forget about it. In our, op in our opinion, they should do at least small analysis of the market in which uh, they operate and collect feedback from their customers. It is suitable to combine different strategies to achieve a better result and uh, by doing that will multiply the power of marketing. This is only one question left. How to choose the correct marketing strategy and which strategies you should combine. This task depends on managers and directors of companies, which of the modern marketing strategies they choose from uh, a wide range of marketing strategies and implement them into their production process and sales strategy. Thank you very much for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Tomasz Mandicek and I would like to present research uh, results 
in the paper with title Comparison of Utilization Level of Knowledge-Based and BIM Technology by Contractors in Management of Construction Projects. Authors of this paper are Peter Mesaroš, Tomáš Mandličák and Anna Maria Behunova. Knowledge technologies are one of the effective tools for process management in various industries and production. According to several researchers, uh, their implementation and use of uh, are beneficial and this also applies to the management of construction projects. This specific sector is largely influenced by a large number of participants with sometimes conflicting uh, interests. Nevertheless, uh, knowledge technologies help uh, the management process and increase the assumption of efficiency in a given sector. Knowledge systems in this area are closely connected with uh, BIM technologies. There are several benefits to use uh, these technologies. This is why it's important to examine their level of use or exploitation and uh, to map this phenomenon in the field of construction projects. This research is aimed uh, to mapping uh, the level uh, of use of these technologies over the last two years and analyzing the trend uh, of use in the management of construction projects. The main goal of the research is to compare the level of use knowledge-based technologies and beam technologies by suppliers in the management of construction companies. Knowledge-based technology and uh, BIM technology are an effective tool for the needs uh, of construction project management. This knowledge has already been based on previous research carried out uh, in the industry. Based on, uh, on previous research and a true theoretical analysis, a problem statement and research goal were set. Comparing the level of use of knowledge-based technology and BIM technology in the Slovak construction industry has certain serves and their potential is greater than the current scope of the use. However, research has confirmed the assumption that the use of knowledge-based and BIM technologies has increased over the last two years. Based on statistical tests, we came to the conclusion uh, that this statement is true and uh, can be accepted as one of the conclusions of the research. In the context uh, of the topic, we can also talk about the future scientific goals in the field. They should reflect the knowledge that this topic is very important and it's important to address and discuss uh, it in the coming period. Research should be moved not only internationally, but above all to focus on the growth rate of the use of BIM uh, technology and knowledge-based technology, which may also reflect the maturity and maturity of the industry in the country in international comparison. Thank you very much for your attention.
Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Josef Husar and I am pleasure to present you on 5th AI International Conference on Management of Manufacturing System, a poster for article A concept for implementation of biological samples monitoring uses ultra-high radiofrequency identification technology. The focus of the presented manuscript is on the design of the concept ultra-high radiofrequency identification technology I meant to tracking biological samples. The purpose of the article is to point out the, po the possibility of changing the current state when barcodes are passed to biological samples. They are then accompanied by a paper request for the test and two sent together to the laboratory. The article is intended to serve as a proposed concept using digitalization and high frequency radio frequency identification. The first part of the manuscript points to the already established air health system and the still unresolved issue of ELAP, electronic laboratory examination. This is following by an analysis of the individual elements of the concept divided into three areas, air fit system, software and biological samples. The second chapter is focusing on the gradual design of components needed for the implementation of this plan. It describes the individual steps from the design of specific hardware through the progressive design of the software structure. Based on the given proposal, several conclusions were drawn, which we can assume, to, but their confirmation is only at the theoretical level. The presented concept is legislatively demanding as about the GDPR. It is a matter of working which personal data on human health. As the main benefit, we can assume the design of a compressive concept using contactless technology with mass reading at the distance of several meter, which is a big benefit for the current epidemiological period when the COVID-19 virus is around us. Thank you for your attention. If you have any question, please contact me on email josef.husar at tuke.sk
dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear old and new friends, it's time for start for the, the closing ceremony of this conference. It's a good opportunity for me, like a general chair, to provide you with some information about the best paper award. Uh, this year, the best award will be provided to the authors from Serbia and Bosnia and Herzegovina for the paper with title Architecture of EOT System for Smart Monitoring and Management of Traffic Noise for authors. Dali Bordobrilovic, Vladimir Brtka, Gordana Jotanovic, Željko Stojanov, Goran Juševac and Milan Malic from University of Sarajevo, Technical Faculty Mihailo Pupin from Zrenjan in Serbia and University of East Sarajevo Faculty of Transport and Traffic Engineering from Doboj, Bosnia and Herzegovina and Company Panoit, Novi Sad from Serbia. Uh, authors will be provided by the uh, certificate and a small voucher. Voucher is for the next year conference and uh, feel free to all of you to save the date for the next year conference. I hope that we will see you in live, not by online, but in live in the great, great place Kirita Zroy in Poland. For the next year we will stay in touch Feel free to uh, inform me for any ideas, any comments, and any suggestions. But for now, I would like to say uh, once again thank you for all the support, all help from any of you. It's uh, very good to know that you are interested for this kind of conference, and every paper is pushed to make the better conference in the future. Thank you a lot. See you in the Poland. Ciao.